Chapter 4 A fine rain, like dust, obstinate and tedious, had been drizzling since morning. Platonov was working in the port, unloading watermelons. At the mill, where he had since the very summer proposed to establish himself, luck had turned against him. After a week he had already quarreled, and almost had a fight, with the foreman, who was extremely brutal with the workers. About a month Sergei Ivanovich had struggled along somehow from hand to mouth, somewheres in the backyards of Temikovskia Street, dragging into the editorial rooms of the Echoes, from time to time. Notes of street accidents or little humorous scenes from the courtrooms of the justices of the peace. But the hard newspaper game had long ago grown distasteful to him. He was always drawn to adventures, to physical labor in the fresh air, to life completely devoid of even the least hint at comfort. To carefree vagabondage, in which a man, having cast from him all possible external conditions, does not know himself what his lot is going to be on the morrow. And for that reason, when from the lower stretches of the Dnieper the first barges with watermelon started coming in, he willingly entered a gang of laborers. In which he was known even from last year, and loved for his good nature, for his comradely spirit, and for his masterly ability of keeping count. This labor was carried on with good teamwork and with skill. Four parties, each of five men, worked on each barge. Number one would reach for a watermelon and pass it on to the second, who was standing on the side of the barge. The second cast it to the third, standing already on the wharf. The third threw it over to the fourth. While the fourth handed it up to the fifth, who stood on a horse cart and laid the watermelons away, now dark green, now white, now striped, into even glistening rows. This work is clean, lively, and progresses rapidly. When a good party is gotten up, it is a pleasure to see how the watermelons fly from hand to hand, are caught with a circus-like quickness and success, and anew, and anew, without a break, fly. In order to fill up the dray. It is only difficult for the novices, that have not as yet gained the skill, have not caught on to that especial sense of the tempo. And it is not as difficult to catch a watermelon as to be able to throw it. Platonov remembered well his first experiences of last year. What swearing, virulent, mocking, coarse, poured down upon him when for the third or fourth time he had been gaping and had slowed up the passing, two watermelons, not thrown in time. Had smashed against the pavement with a succulent crunch, while the completely lost Platonov dropped the one which he was holding in his hands as well. The first time they treated him gently, on the second day, however, for every mistake they began to deduct from him five kopecks per watermelon out of the common share. The following time when this happened, they threatened to throw him out of the party at once, without any reckoning. Platonov even now still remembered how a sudden fury seized him, ah, uh, so. The devil take you, he had thought. And yet you want me to be cherry of your watermelons? So then, here you are, here you are, this flare-up helped him as though instantaneously. He carelessly caught the watermelons, just as carelessly threw them over and to his amazement suddenly felt that precisely just now he had gotten into the real swing of the work with all his muscles, sight, and breathing. And understood, that the most important thing was not to think at all of the watermelons representing some value, and that then everything went well. When he, finally, had fully mastered this art, it served him for a long time as a pleasant and entertaining athletic game of its own kind. But that, too, passed away. He reached, in the end, the stage where he felt himself a will-less, mechanical wheel in a general machine consisting of five men and an endless chain of flying watermelons. Now he was number two. Bending downward rhythmically, he, without looking, received with both hands the cold, springy, heavy watermelon, swung it to the right. And, also almost without looking, or looking only out of the corner of his eye, tossed it downward, and immediately once again bent down for the next watermelon. And his ear seized at this time how smack smack, smack smack, the caught watermelons slapped against hands. And immediately bending downwards again, through, letting the air out noisily, gee, gee. The present work was very profitable. Their gang, consisting of forty men, had taken on the work, thanks to the great rush, not by the day but by the amount of work done, 
by the wagon load. Zavarotny, the head, an enormous, mighty Poltavian, had succeeded with extreme deftness in getting around the owner, a young man, and, to boot, in all probability not very experienced as yet. The owner, it is true, came to his senses later and wanted to change the stipulations, but experienced melon growers dissuaded him from it in time, drop it. They'll kill you, they told him simply and firmly. And so, through this very stroke of good luck every member of the gang was now earning up to four rubles a day. They all worked with unusual ardor, even with some sort of vehemence. And if it had been possible to measure with some apparatus the labor of each one of them, then, in all probability, the number of units of energy created would have equaled the work of a large Voronezian Percheron. However, Zavarotny was not satisfied even with this, he hurried and hurried his lads on all the time. Professional ambition was speaking within him. He wanted to bring the daily earnings of every member of the gang up to five rubles per snout. And gaily, with unusual ease, twinkled from the harbor to the wagon, twirling and flashing, the wet green and white watermelons, and their succulent plashing resounded against accustomed palms. But now a long blast sounded on the dredging machine in the port. A second, a third, responded to it on the river, a few more on shore. And for a long time they roared together in a mighty chorus of different voices. By STAA, hoarsely and thickly, exactly like a locomotive blast, Zavarotny started roaring. And now the last smack smack, and the work stopped instantaneously. Platonov with enjoyment straightened out his back and bent it backward, and spread out his swollen arms. With pleasure he thought of having already gotten over that first pain in all the muscles, which tells so during the first days, when one is just getting back into the work after disuse. While up to this day, awaking in the mornings in his lair on Temnikovskia, also to the sound of a factory blast agreed upon, he would during the first minutes experience such fearful pains in his neck, back, in his arms and legs, that it seemed to him as if only a miracle would be able to compel him to get up and take a few steps. Go o o and yet, Zavarotny began to clamor again. The stevedores went down to the water, got down on their knees or laid down flat on the gangplank or on the rafts. And, scooping up the water in handfuls, washed their wet, heated faces and arms. Right here, too, on the shore, to one side, where a little grass had been left yet, they disposed themselves for dinner, placed in a circle ten of the most ripe watermelons, black bread. And twenty dried porgies. Gavryushka the bullet was already running with a half-gallon bottle to the pothouse and was singing as he went the soldier's signal for dinner. Drag spoon and mess kit out. If there's no bread, eat without. A barefooted urchin, dirty and so ragged that there was more of his bare body than clothes upon him, ran up to the gang. Which one of you here is Platonov? He asked, quickly running over them with his thievish eyes. I'm Platonov and by what name do they tease you? Around the corner here, behind the church, some sort of a young lady is waiting for you. Here's a note for you. The whole gang neighed deeply. What you open up your mouths for, you pack of fools, said Platonov calmly. Give me the note here. This was a letter from Jenka, written in a round, naive, rolling, childish handwriting, and not very well spelt. Sergei Ivanik. Forgive me that I disturb you. I must talk over a very, very important matter with you. I would not be troubling you if it was trifles. For only ten minutes in all, Jenka, whom you know, from Anna Markovna's. Platonov got up. I'm going away for a little while, he said to Zavarotny. When you begin, I'll be in my place. Now you've found something to do, lazily and contemptuously said the head of the gang. There's the night for that business. Go ahead, go ahead, who's holding you? But only if you won't be here when we begin work, then this day don't count. I'll take any tramp. And as many watermelons as he busts, that's out of your share, too. I didn't think it of you, Platonov, that you're such a he-dog. Jenka was waiting for him in the microscopic square. Sheltered between a church and the wharf, and consisting of ten sari poplars. She had on a grey, 
one-piece street dress, a simple, round, straw hat with a small black ribbon. And yet, even though she has dressed herself simply, reflected Platonov, looking at her from a distance with his habitually puckered eyes, and yet, every man will walk past, give a look. And inevitably look back three or four times. He'll feel the especial tone at once. Howdy do, Jenka. Very glad to see you, he said cordially, squeezing the girl's hand. There, now, I didn't expect you. Jenka was reserved, sad, and apparently troubled over something. Platonov at once understood and sensed this. You excuse me, Janechka, I must have dinner right away, said he, so, perhaps, you'll go together with me and tell me what's the matter, while I'll manage to eat at the same time. There's a modest little inn not far from here. At this time there are no people there at all, and there's even a tiny little stall, a sort of a private room. That will be just the thing for you and me. Let's go. Perhaps you'll also have a bite of something. No. I won't eat, answered Jenka hoarsely, and I won't detain you for long, a few minutes. I have to talk things over, have some advice, but I haven't anybody. Very well. Let's go then. In whatever way I can, I'm always at your service, in everything. I love you very much, Jenka. She looked at him sadly and gratefully. I know this, Serge Ivanovich, that's why I've come. You need money, perhaps. Just say so. I haven't got much with me, myself. But the gang will trust me with an advance. No, thanks, it isn't that at all. I'll tell everything at once, there, where we're going now. In the dim, low-sealed little inn, the customary haunt of petty thieves, who transacted their business and divvied up there, and where trade became brisk only in the evening. And went on until very far into the night, Platonov took up a little half-dark cubby hole. Give me boiled meat, cucumbers, a large glass of vodka, and bread, he ordered the waiter. The waiter, a young fellow with a dirty face, pug-nosed. As dirty and greasy in all his person as though he had just been pulled out of a cesspool, wiped his lips and asked hoarsely. How many kopecks bread? As much as it comes to. Then he started laughing. Bring as much as possible, we'll reckon it up later, and some bread cider. Well, Jenny, say what your trouble is. I can already see by your face that there's trouble, or something distasteful in general. Go ahead and tell it. Jenka for a long time plucked her handkerchief and looked at the tips of her slippers, as though, gathering her strength. Timorousness had taken possession of her, the necessary and important words would not come into her mind, for anything. Platonov came to her aid. Don't be embarrassed, my dear Jenny, tell all there is. For you know that I'm like one of the family, and will never give you away. And perhaps I may really give you some worthwhile advice. Well, dive off with a splash into the water, begin. That's just it, I don't know how to begin, said Jenka irresolutely. Here's what, Sergei Ivanovich, I'm a sick woman. Understand, sick in a bad way. With the most nasty disease. Do you know which? Go on, said Platonov, nodding his head. And I've been that way for a long time, more than a month, a month and a half, maybe. Yes, more than a month. Because I found out about this on the Trinity. Platonov quickly rubbed his forehead with his hand. Wait a while, I've recalled it. This was that day I was there together with the students, isn't that so? That's right, Sergei Ivanovich, that's so. Ah, uh, Jenka, said Platonov reproachfully and with regret. For do you know, that after this two of the students got sick? Wasn't it from you? Jenka wrathfully and disdainfully flashed her eyes. Perhaps even from me. How should I know? There were a lot of them. I remember there was this one, now, who was even trying to pick a fight with you all the time. A tall sort of fellow, fair-haired, in Ponsne. Yes. Yes. That's Sobashnikov. They passed the news to me. That's he, that one was nothing, a little coxcomb. But then the other, 
him I'm sorry for. Although I've known him long. Somehow I never made the right inquiries about his name. I only remember that he comes from some city or other, Polyansk. Svenigorotsk. His comrades called him Ramses. When the physicians, he turned to several physicians, when they told him irrevocably that he had the Louis. He went home and shot himself. And in the note that he wrote there were amazing things, something like this, I supposed all the meaning of life to be in the triumph of mind, beauty and good. With this disease I am not a man, but junk, rottenness, carrion, a candidate for a progressive paralytic. My human dignity cannot reconcile itself to this. But guilty in all that has happened, and therefore in my death as well, am I alone, for that I, obeying a momentary bestial inclination, took a woman without love, for money. For that reason have I earned the punishment which I myself lay upon me. I am sorry for him, added Platonov quietly. Jenka dilated her nostrils. But I, now, not the very least bit. That's wrong. You go away now, young fellow. When I'll need you I'll call out, said Platonov to the serving man, absolutely wrong, Janechka. This was an unusually big and forceful man. Such come only one to the hundreds of thousands. I don't respect suicides. Most frequent of all, these are little boys, who shoot and hang themselves over trifles, like a child that has not been given a piece of candy. And butts its head against a wall to spite those around it. But before his death I reverently and with sorrow bow my head. He was a wise, generous, kindly man, attentive to all, and, as you see, too strict to himself. But to me this is absolutely all one, obstinately contradicted Jenka, wise or foolish, honest or dishonest, old or young, I have come to hate them all. Because, look upon me, what am I? Some sort of universal spittoon, cesspool, privy. Think of it, Platonov, why, thousands, thousands of people have taken me, clutched me, grunted, snorted over me. And all those who were, and all those who might yet have been on my bed, oh, how I hate them all. If I only could, I would sentence them to torture by fire and iron. I would order. You are malicious and proud, Jenny, said Platonov quietly. I was neither malicious nor proud. It's only now. I wasn't ten yet when my own mother sold me. And since that time I've been traveling from hand to hand. If only someone had seen a human being in me. No. I am vermin, refuse, worse than a beggar, worse than a thief, worse than a murderer. Even a hangman, we have even such coming to the establishment, and even he would have treated me loftily, with loathing, I, am nothing, I, am a public wench. Do you understand, Sergei Ivanovich, what a horrible word this is? Public. This means nobody's, not papa's, not mama's, not Russian, not Ryazin, but simply, public. And not once did it enter anybody's head to walk up to me and think, why, now, this is a human being too, she has a heart and a brain. She thinks of something, feels something, for she's not made out of wood, and isn't stuffed with straw, small hay, or excelsior. And yet, only I feel this. I, perhaps, am the only one out of all of them who feels the horror of her position, this black, stinking, filthy pit. But then, all the girls with whom I have met, and with whom I am living right now, understand, Platonov, understand me, why, they don't realize anything. Talking, walking pieces of meat. And this is even worse than my malice. You are right, said Platonov quietly. And this is one of those questions where you'll always run up against a wall. No one will help you. No one, no one, passionately exclaimed Jenka. Do you remember, this was while you were there, a student carried away our Lubka. Why, certainly, I remember well. Well, and what then? And this is what, that yesterday she came back tattered, wet. Crying. Left her, the skunk. Played a while at kindliness, and then away with her. You, he says, are a sister. I, he says, will save you, 
make a human being of you. Is that possible? Just so. One man I did see, kindly, indulgent, without the designs of a he-dog, that's you. But then, you're altogether different. You're somehow queer. You're always wandering somewhere, seeking something. You forgive me, Sergei Ivanovich, you're some sort of a little innocent. And that's just why I've come to you, to you alone. Speak on, Janechka. And so, when I found out that I was sick, I almost went out of my mind from wrath. I choked from wrath. I thought, and here's the end, therefore, there's no more use in pitying, there's nothing to grieve about, nothing to expect. The lid. But for all that I have borne, can it be that there's no paying back for it? Can it be that there's no justice in the world? Can it be that I can't even feast myself with revenge? For that I have never known love, that of family life I know only by hearsay, that, like a disgusting, nasty little dog, they call me near, pat me and then boot me over the head, get out. That they made me over, from a human being, equal to all of them, no more foolish than all those I've met, made me over into a floor mop, some sort of a sewer pipe for their filthy pleasures. Ugh! Is it possible that for all of this I must take even such a disease with gratitude as well? Or am I a slave? A dumb object? A pack horse? And so, Platonov, it was just then that I resolved to infect them all, young, old, poor, rich, handsome, hideous, all, all, all. Platonov, who had already long since put his plate away from him, was looking at her with astonishment, and even more, almost with horror. He, who had seen in life much of the painful, the filthy, at times even of the bloody, he grew frightened with an animal fright before this intensity of enormous, unvented hatred. Coming to himself, he said. One great writer tells of such a case. The Prussians conquered the French and lorded it over them in every possible way, shot the men, violated the women, pillaged the houses. Burned down the fields. And so one handsome woman, a French woman, very handsome, having become infected, began out of spite to infect all the Germans who happened to fall into her embraces. She made ill whole hundreds, perhaps even thousands. And when she was dying in a hospital, she recalled this with joy and with pride, thirty-two but then, those were enemies. Trampling upon her fatherland and slaughtering her brothers. But you, you, Janechka. But I, all, just all. Tell me, Sergei Ivanovich, only tell me on your conscience, if you were to find in the street a child, whom someone had dishonored, had abused, well, let's say, had stuck its eyes out. Cut its ears off, and then you were to find out that this man is at this minute walking past you, and that only God alone, if only he exists, is looking at you this minute from heaven, what would you do? Don't know, answered Platonov, dully and downcast. But he paled, and his fingers underneath the table convulsively clenched into fists, perhaps I would kill him. Not, perhaps, but certainly. I know you, I sense you. Well, and now think, every one of us has been abused so, when we were children. Children, passionately moaned out Jenka and covered her eyes for a moment with her palm. Why, it comes to me, you also spoke of this at one time, in our place, wasn't it on that same evening before the Trinity? Yes, children, foolish, trusting, blind, greedy, frivolous. And we cannot tear ourselves out of our harness, where are we to go? What are we to do? And please, don't you think it, Sergei Ivanovich, that the spite within me is strong only against those who wrong just me, me personally? No, against all our guests in general. All these proud gallants, from little to big. Well, and so I have resolved to avenge myself and my sisters. Is that good or no? Janeka, really I don't know. I can't. I dare not say anything. I don't understand. But even that's not the main thing. For the main thing is this, I infected them, and did not feel anything, no pity, no remorse, no guilt before God or my fatherland. Within me was only joy, as in a hungry wolf that has managed to get at blood. 
But yesterday something happened which even I can't understand. A cadet came to me, altogether a little bit of a lad, silly. With yellow around his mouth. He used to come to me as far back as last winter. And then suddenly I took pity on him. Not because he was very handsome and very young. And not because he had always been very polite, even tender, if you will. No, both the one and the other had come to me, but I did not spare them, with enjoyment I marked them off. Just like cattle, with a red-hot brand. But this one I suddenly pitied. I myself don't understand, why. I can't make it out. It seemed to me, that it would be all the same as stealing money from a little simpleton, a little idiot. Or hitting a blind man, or cutting a sleeper's throat, if he only were some dried-up marasmus or a nasty little brute, or a lecherous old fellow, I would not have stopped. But he was healthy, robust, with chest and arms like a statue's, and I could not. I gave him his money back, showed him my disease, in a word, I acted like a fool among fools. He went away from me, burst into tears. And now since last evening I haven't slept. I walk around as in a fog. Therefore, I'm thinking right now, therefore, that which I meditated. My dream to infect them all, to infect their fathers, mothers, sisters, brides, even all the world, therefore, all this was folly, an empty fantasy, since I have stopped. Once again, I don't understand anything. Sergei Ivanovich, you are so wise, you have seen so much of life, help me, then, to find myself now. I don't know, Janechka. Quietly pronounced Platonov. Not that I fear telling you, or advising you, but I know absolutely nothing. This is above my reason, above conscience. Jenny crossed her fingers and nervously cracked them. And I, too, don't know. Therefore, that which I thought, is not the truth. Therefore, there is but one thing left me. This thought came into my head this morning. Don't, don't do it, Janechka. Jenny, Platonov quickly interrupted her. There's one thing, to hang myself. No, no, Jenny, anything but that. If there were other circumstances, unsurmountable, I would, believe me, tell you boldly, well, it's no use, Jenny. It's time to close up shop. But what you need isn't that at all. If you wish, I can suggest one way out to you, no less malicious and merciless. But which, perhaps, will satiate your wrath a hundredfold. What's that? asked Jenny, wearily, as though suddenly wilted after her flare-up. Well, this is it. You're still young, and I'll tell you the truth, you are very handsome, that is, you can be, if you only want to, unusually stunning. That's even more than beauty. But you've never yet known the bounds and the power of your appearance. And, mainly, you don't know to what a degree such natures as yours are bewitching, and how mightily they enchain men to them, and make out of them more than slaves and brutes. You are proud. You are brave, you are independent, you are a clever woman. I know, you have read a great deal, let's presuppose even trashy books, but still you have read, you have an entirely different speech from the others. With a successful turn of life, you can cure yourself, you can get out of these yamkas, these little ditches, into freedom. You have only to stir a finger, in order to see at your feet hundreds of men. Submissive, ready for your sake for vileness, for theft, for embezzlement. Lord it over them with tight reins, with a cruel whip in your hands. Ruin them, make them go out of their minds, as long as your desire and energy hold out. Look, my dear Jenny, who manages life now if not women. Yesterday's chambermaid, laundress, chorus girl goes through estates worth millions, the way a countrywoman of Tver cracks sunflower seeds. A woman scarcely able to sign her name, at times affects the destiny of an entire kingdom through a man. Hereditary princes marry the streetwalkers, the kept mistresses of yesterday. Janechka, there is the scope for your unbridled vengeance. While I will admire you from a distance. For you, you are made of this stuff, you are a bird of prey. A spoliator. Perhaps not with such a broad sweep, 
but you will cast them down under your feet. No, faintly smiled Jenka. I thought of this before. But something of the utmost importance has burned out within me. There are no forces within me, there is no will within me, no desires. I am somehow all empty inside, rotted. Well, now, you know, there's a mushroom like that, white, round, you squeeze it. And snuff pours out of it. And the same way with me. This life has eaten out everything within me save malice. And I am flabby, and my malice is flabby. I'll see some little boy again, will take pity on him, will be punishing myself again. No, it's better, better so. She became silent. And Platonov did not know what to say. It became oppressive and awkward for both. Finally, Jenka got up, and, without looking at Platonov, extended her cold, feeble hand to him. Goodbye, Sergei Ivanovich. Excuse me, that I took up your time. Oh, well, I can see myself that you'd help me, if you only could. But, evidently, there's nothing to be done here. Goodbye. Only don't do anything foolish, Janetchka. I implore you. Oh, that's all right, said she and made a tired gesture with her hand. Having come out of the square, they parted. But, having gone a few steps, Jenka suddenly called after him. Sergei Ivanovich, oh Sergei Ivanovich. He stopped, turned around, walked back to her. Roly Polly croaked last evening in our drawing room. He jumped and he jumped, and then suddenly plumped down. Oh, well, it's an easy death at least. And also I forgot to ask you, Sergei Ivanovich. This is the last, now. Is there a god or no? Platonov knit his eyebrows. What answer can I make? I don't know. I think that there is, but not such as we imagine him. He is more wise, more just. And future life? There, after death. Is there, now, as they tell us, a paradise or hell? Is that the truth? Or is there just nothing at all? A barren void? A sleep without a dream? A dark basement? Platonov kept silent, trying not to look at Jenka. He felt oppressed and frightened. I don't know, said he, finally, with an effort. I don't want to lie to you. Jenka sighed, and smiled with a pitiful, twisted smile. Well, thanks, my dear. And thanks for even that much. I wish you happiness. With all my soul. Well, goodbye. She turned away from him and began slowly, with a wavering walk, to climb up the hill. Platonov returned to work just in the nick of time. The gathering of tramps, scratching, yawning, working out their accustomed dislocations, were getting into their places. Zavarotny, at a distance, with his keen eyes caught sight of Platonov and began to yell over the whole port. You did manage to get here in time. You round-shouldered devil. But I was already wanting to take you by the tail and chase you out of the gang. Well, get in your place. Well, but I did get a great guy in you, Serejka, he added, in a kindly manner. If only it was night, but no, look you, he starts in playing Ring Around a Rosy in broad daylight. Chapter 5 Saturday was the customary day of the doctor's inspection, for which they prepared very carefully and with quaking in all the houses. As, however, even society ladies prepare themselves, when getting ready for a visit to a physician specialist. They diligently made their intimate toilet and inevitably put on clean underthings, even as dressy as possible. The windows toward the street were closed with shutters, while at one of those windows, which gave out upon the yard, was put a table with a hard bolster to put under the back. All the girls were agitated. And what if there's a disease I haven't noticed myself? That means being packed off into a hospital, disgrace, the tedium of hospital life, bad food. The hard course of treatment. Only Big Manka, or otherwise Manka the Crocodile, Zoe, and Henrietta, all thirty years old, and, therefore, in the reckoning of Yama, already old prostitutes. Who had seen everything, 
had grown inured to everything, grown indifferent to their trade, like white, fat circus horses, remained imperturbably calm. Menka the crocodile even often said of herself, I have gone through fire and water and pipes of brass. Nothing will stick to me any more. Jenka, since morning, was meek and pensive. She presented to little white Menka a golden bracelet, a medallion upon a thin little chain with her photograph, and a silver neck crucifix. Tomorrow she moved through entreaty into taking two rings for remembrance, one of silver, in three hoops, that could be moved apart, with a heart in the middle, and a hand on each side of it. That clasped one another when all the three parts of the ring were compressed, while the second was of thin gold wire, set with an almondine. As for my underwear, Tamarachka, you give it to Anushka, the chambermaid. Let her wash it out well and wear it in good health, in memory of me. The two of them were sitting in Tamara's room. Jenka had in the very morning sent after cognac, and now slowly, as though lazily, was imbibing wineglass after wineglass, eating lemon and a piece of sugar after drinking. Tamara was observing this for the first time and wondered, because Jenka had always disliked wine, and drank very rarely, and then only at the constraint of guests. What are you giving stuff away so today? asked Tamara. Just as though you'd gotten ready to die, or to go into a convent. Yes, and I will go away, answered Jenka listlessly. I am weary, Tamarachka. Well, which one of us has a good time? Well, no. It isn't so much that I'm weary. But somehow everything, everything is all the same. I look at you, at the table, at the bottle, at my hands and feet. And I'm thinking, that all this is alike and everything is to no purpose. There's no sense in anything. Just like on some old, old picture. Look there, there's a soldier walking on the street, but it's all one to me, as though they had wound up a doll, and it's moving. And that he's wet under the ram. Is also all one to me. And that he'll die, and I'll die, and you, Tamara, will die, in this also I see nothing frightful. Nothing amazing. So simple and wearisome is everything to me. Jenka was silent for a while. Drank one more wine glass. Sucked the sugar, and, still looking out at the street, suddenly asked. Tell me, please, Tamara, I've never asked you about it, from where did you get in here, into this cat house? You don't at all resemble all of us, you know everything, for everything that turns up you have a good, clever word. Even French, now, how well you spoke at that time. But none of us knows anything at all about you. Who are you? Darling Janetchka, really, it's not worthwhile. A life like any life. I went to boarding school, was a governess. Sang in a choir, then kept a shooting gallery in a summer garden. And then got mixed up with a certain charlatan and taught myself to shoot with a Winchester. I traveled with circuses, I represented an American Amazon. I used to shoot splendidly. Then I found myself in a monastery. There I passed two years. I've been through a lot. Can't recall everything. I used to steal. You've lived through a great deal. Checkered like. But then, my years are not a few. Well, what do you think, how many? Twenty-two. 24. No, my angel. It just struck 32 a week ago. I, if you like, am older than all of you here in Anna Markovna's. Only I didn't wonder at anything, didn't take anything near to heart. As you see, I never drink. I occupy myself very carefully with the care of my body. And the main thing, the very main thing, I don't allow myself ever to be carried away with men. Well, but what about your Senka? Senka, that's a horse of another color. The heart of woman is foolish, inconsistent. Can it possibly live without love? And even so, I don't love him, but just so, a self-deception. But, however, I shall be in very great need of Senka soon. Jenka suddenly grew animated and looked at her friend with curiosity. But how did you come to get stuck right here, in this hole? So clever, handsome, 
sociable. I'd have to take a long time in telling it. And then I'm too lazy. I got in here out of love. I got mixed up with a certain young man and tackled a revolution with him. For we always act so, we women, where the deary is looking, there we also look. What the deary sees, that we also see. I didn't believe at soul in his work, but I went. A flattering man he was. Smart, a good talker, a good looker. Only he proved to be a skunk and a traitor afterwards. He played at revolution, while he himself gave his comrades away to the gendarmes. A stool pigeon, he was. When they had killed and shown him up, then all the foolishness left me. However, it was necessary to conceal myself. I changed my passport. Then they advised me, that the easiest thing of all was to screen myself with a yellow ticket. And then the fun began. And even here I'm on a sort of pasture ground. When the time comes, the successful moment arrives, I'll go away. Where? asked Jenny with impatience. The world is big. And I love life. There, now, I was the same way in the convent, I lived on and I lived on, sang Antiphonies and Dullias, until I had rested up, and had finally grown weary of it, and then all at once, hop. And into a cabaret. Wasn't that some jump? The same way out of here. I'll get into a theater, into a circus, into a corps de ballet, but do you know, Janechka, I'm drawn to the thieving trade the most, after all. Daring, dangerous. Hard, and somehow intoxicating. It's drawing me, the game of it. Don't you mind that I'm so respectable and modest, and can appear an educated young lady? I'm entirely, entirely different. Her eyes suddenly blazed up, vividly and gaily. There's a devil dwells in me. It's all very well for you, pensively and with weariness pronounced Jenny. You at least desire something, but my soul is some sort of carrion. I'm twenty-five years old, now. But my soul is like that of an old woman, shriveled up, smelling of the earth. And if I had only lived sensibly. Ugh. There was only some sort of slush. Drop it, Jenka. You're talking foolishly. You're smart, you're original, you have that special power before which men crawl and creep so willingly. You go away from here, too. Not with me, of course, I'm always single but go away all by your own self. Jenka shook her head and quietly, without tears, hid her face in her palms. No, she responded dully, after a long silence, no, this won't work out with me, fate has chewed me all up. I'm not a human being any more, but some sort of dirty cud. Eh. She suddenly made a gesture of despair. Let's better drink some cognac, Janechka, she addressed herself, and let's suck the lemon a little, brr, what nasty stuff. And where does Anushka always get such abominable stuff? If you smear a dog's wool with it, it will fall off. And always, the low-down thing, she'll take an extra half. Once I somehow ask her, what are you hoarding money for? Well, I, she says, am saving it up for a wedding. What sort, she says, of joy will it be for my husband, that I'll offer him up my innocence alone. I must earn a few hundreds on top of that. She's happy. I have here, Tamara, a little money in the little box under the mirror, you pass it on to her, please. And what are you about, you fool, do you want to die, or what? Sharply, with reproach, said Tamara. No, I'm saying it just so, if anything happens. Take it, now, take the money. Maybe they'll take me off to the hospital. And how do you know what's going to take place there? I left myself some small change, if anything happens. And supposing that I wanted to do something to myself in downright earnest, Tamarachka, is it possible that you'd hinder me? Tamara looked at her fixedly, deeply, and calmly. Jenny's eyes were sad, and as though vacant. The living fire had become extinguished in them, and they seemed turbid, just as though faded, with whites like moonstone. No, Tamara said at last, quietly but firmly. If it was on account of love, 
I'd interfere, if it was on account of money, I'd talk you out of it, but there are cases where one must not interfere. I wouldn't help, of course. But I also wouldn't seize you and interfere with you. At this moment the quick-limbed housekeeper Zosia whirled through the corridor with an outcry. Ladies, get dressed. The doctor has arrived. Ladies, get dressed. Lively, ladies. Well, go on, Tamara, go on, said Jenka tenderly, getting up. I'll run into my room for just a minute, I haven't changed my dress yet, although, to tell the truth, this also is all one. When they'll be calling out for me, and I don't come in time, call out, or run in after me. And, going out of Tamara's room, she embraced her by the shoulder, as though by chance, and stroked it tenderly. Dr. Klemenko, the official city doctor, was preparing in the parlor everything indispensable for an inspection, Vaseline, a solution of sublimate, a little mirror, and other things, and was placing them on a separate little table. Here also were arranged for him the white blanks of the girls, replacing their passports, as well as a general alphabetical list. The girls, dressed only in their chemises, stockings, and slippers, were standing and sitting at a distance. Nearer the table was standing the proprietress herself, Anna Markovna, while a little behind her were Emma Edwardovna and Zosia. The doctor, aged, disheartened, slovenly. A man indifferent to everything, put the pince nez crookedly upon his nose, looked at the list, and called out. Alexandra Budzinskaya. The frowning, little, pug-nosed Nina stepped out. Preserving on her face an angry expression, and breathing heavily from shame, from the consciousness of her own awkwardness, and from the exertions, she clumsily climbed up on the table. The doctor, squinting through his pince nez and dropping it every minute, carried out the inspection. Go ahead. You're sound. And on the reverse side of the blank he marked off, 28th of August. Sound, and put down a curly cue. And, before he had even finished writing, called out. Voschenkova, Irene. Now it was the turn of Lubka. She, during the past month and a half of comparative freedom, had had time to grow unaccustomed to the inspections of every week. And when the doctor turned up the chemise over her breast, she suddenly turned as red as only very bashful women can, even with her back and breast. After her was the turn of Zoe. Then of little white Manka, after that of Tamara and Nierka, the last, the doctor found, had gonorrhea, and ordered her to be sent off to a hospital. The doctor carried out the inspection with amazing rapidity. It was now nearly twenty years that every week, on Saturdays, he had to inspect in such a manner several hundred girls. And he had worked out that habitual technical dexterity and rapidity, a calm carelessness of movements, which is frequently to be found in circus artists, in card sharpers, in furniture movers and packers, and in other professionals. And he carried out his manipulations with the same calmness with which a drover or a veterinary inspects several hundred head of cattle in a day. Did he ever think that before him were living people, or that he appeared as the last and most important link of that fearful chain which is called legalized prostitution? No. And even if he did experience this, then it must have been in the very beginning of his career. Now before him were only naked abdomens, naked backs, and opened mouths. Not one exemplar of all this faceless herd of every Saturday would he have recognized subsequently on the street. The main thing was the necessity of finishing as soon as possible the inspection in one establishment, in order to pass on to another, to a third, a ninth, a twentieth. Susanna Raitsina. The doctor finally called out. No one walked up to the table. All the inmates of the house began to exchange glances and to whisper. Jenka. Where's Jenka? But she was not among the girls. Then Tamara, just released by the doctor, moved a little forward and said. She isn't here. She hasn't had a chance to get herself ready yet. Excuse me, mister. Doctor, I'll go right away and call her. She ran into the corridor and did not return for a long time. After her went, at first Emma Edwardovna, then Zosia, several girls, and even Anna Markovna herself. Pfui. 
What indecency is this? The majestic Emma Edwardovna was saying in the corridor, making an indignant face. And eternally this Jenka. Always this Jenka. It seems my patience has already burst. But Jenka was nowhere, neither in her room, nor in Tamara's. They looked into other chambers, in all the out-of-the-way corners. But she did not prove to be even there. We must look in the water closet. Perhaps she's there, surmised Zoe. But this institution was locked from the inside with a bolt. Emma Edwardovna knocked on the door with her fist. Jenny, do come out at last. What foolishness is this? And, raising her voice, she cried out impatiently and threateningly. Do you hear, you swine? Come out this minute, the doctor's waiting. But there was no answer of any sort. All exchanged glances with fear in their eyes, with one and the same thought in mind. Emma Edwardovna shook the door by the brass knob, but the door did not yield. Go after Simeon. Anna Markovna directed. Simeon was called. He came, sleepy and morose, as was his wont. By the distracted faces of the girls and the housekeepers, he already saw that some misunderstanding or other had occurred, in which his professional cruelty and strength were required. When they explained to him what the matter was, he silently took the doorknob with both hands, braced himself against the wall, and gave a yank. The knob remained in his hands. And he himself, staggering backward, almost fell to the floor on his back. A A, hell, he began to growl in a stifled voice. Give me a table knife. Through the crack of the door he felt the inner bolt with the table knife. Whittled away with the blade the edges of the crack, and widened it so that he could at last push the end of the knife through it, and began gradually to scrape back the bolt. Only the grating of metal against metal could be heard. Finally Simeon threw the door wide open. Jenka was hanging in the middle of the water closet on a tape from her corset, fastened to the lamp hook. Her body, already motionless after an unprolonged agony, was slowly swinging in the air, and describing scarcely perceptible turns to the right and left around its vertical axis. Her face was bluishly purple, and the tip of the tongue was thrust out between clenched and bared teeth. The lamp which had been taken off was also here, sprawling on the floor. Someone began to squeal hysterically, and all the girls, like a stampeded herd, crowding and jostling each other in the narrow corridor, vociferating and choking with hysterical sobbings. Started in to run. The doctor came upon hearing the outcries. Came, precisely, and not ran. Seeing what the matter was, he did not become amazed or excited. During his practice as an official city doctor, he had had his fill of seeing such things, so that he had already grown benumbed and hardened to human sufferings, wounds and death. He ordered Simeon to lift the corpse of Jenka a bit upward, and himself getting up on the seat, cut through the tape. Proforma, he ordered Jenka's body to be borne away into the room that had been hers, and tried with the help of the same Simeon to produce artificial respiration. But after five minutes gave it up as a bad job, fixed the pince-nez, which had become crooked, on his nose, and said. Call the police in to make a protocol. Again Burkish came, again whispered for a long time with the proprietress in her little bit of a cabinet, and again crunched in his pocket a new hundred-ruble bill. The protocol was made in five minutes. And Jenka, just as half-naked as she had hung herself, was carted away in a hired wagon into an anatomical theater, wrapped up in and covered with two straw mats. Emma Edwardovna was the first to find the note that Jenka had left on her night table. On a sheet, torn out of the income expense book, compulsory for every prostitute, in pencil, in a naive, rounded, childish handwriting, by which, however, it could be judged that the hands of the suicide had not trembled during the last minutes, was written. I beg that no one be blamed for my death. I am dying because I have become infected and also because all people are scoundrels and it is very disgusting to live. How to divide my things, Tamara knows about that. I told her in detail. Emma Edwardovna turned around upon Tamara, who was right on the spot among a number of other girls, and with eyes filled with a cold, 
green hatred, hissed out. Then you knew, you low-down thing. What she was preparing to do. You knew, you vermin. You knew and didn't tell. She already had swung back, in order, as was her wont, to hit Tamara cruelly and calculatingly. But suddenly stopped just as she was, with gaping mouth and with eyes wide open. It was just as though she was seeing, for the first time, Tamara, who was looking at her with a firm, wrathful, unbearable gaze, and slowly, slowly was raising from below. And at last brought up to the level of the housekeeper's face, a small object, glistening with white metal. Chapter 6 That very same day, at evening, a very important event took place in the house of Anna Markovna, the whole institution, with land and house. With live and inanimate stock, passed into the hands of Emma Edwardovna. They had been speaking of this, on and off, for a long time in the establishment. But when the rumors so unexpectedly, immediately right after the death of Jenka, turned into realities, the misses could not for a long time come to themselves for amazement and fear. They knew well, having experienced the sway of the German upon themselves, her cruel, implacable pedantism. Her greed, arrogance, and, finally, her perverted, exacting, repulsive love, now for one, now for another favorite. Besides that, it was no mystery to anyone, that out of the fifteen thousand which Emma Edwardovna had to pay the former proprietress for the firm and for the property, one-third belonged to Burkish. Who had, for a long time already, been carrying on half-friendly, half-business relations with the fat housekeeper. From the union of two such people, shameless, pitiless, and covetous, the girls could expect all sorts of disasters for themselves. Anna Markovna had to let the house go so cheaply not simply because Burkish, even if he had not known about certain shady little transactions to her credit, could still at any time he liked to trip her up and eat her up without leaving anything. Of pretexts and cavils for this even a hundred could be found every day, and certain ones of them not merely threatened the shutting down of the house alone, but, if you like, even with the court. But, dissembling, ONG and sighing, bewailing her poverty, her maladies and orphanhood, Anna Markovna at soul was glad of even such a settlement. And then it must be said, she was already for a long time feeling the approach of senile infirmity, together with all sorts of ailments and the thirst for complete, benevolent rest. Undisturbed by anything. All, of which she had not even dared dream in her early youth, when she herself had yet been a prostitute of the rank and file, all had now come to her of itself, one in addition to the other. Peaceful old age, a house, like a cup brimming over, on one of the snug, quiet streets, almost in the center of the city, 120,000 rubles in the International Bank. The adored daughter Bertie, who, if not today then tomorrow, was to marry a respected man, an engineer, a house owner, and member of the city council. Provided for as she was with a respectable dowry and magnificent valuables. Now it was possible peacefully, without hurrying, with gusto, to dine and sup on sweet things. For which Anna Markovna had always nourished a great weakness. To drink after dinner good, homemade, strong cherry brandy. And of evenings to play a bit at, preference, for kopeck stakes, with esteemed elderly ladies of her acquaintance, who, even although they never as much as let it appear that they knew the real trade of the little old woman, did in reality know it very well. And not only did not condemn her business but even bore themselves with respect toward those enormous percentages which she earned upon her capital. And these charming friends, the joy and consolation of her untroubled old age, were, one, the keeper of a loan office, another, the proprietress of a lively hotel near the railroad. The third, the owner of a jewelry shop, not large, but all the go and well known among the big thieves, etc. And about them, in her turn, Anna Markovna knew and could tell several shady and not especially flattering anecdotes. But in their society it was not customary to talk of the sources of the family well-being, only cleverness, daring, success, and decent manners were esteemed. But, even besides that, Anna Markovna, sufficiently limited in mind and not especially developed, had some sort of an amazing inner intuition. 
which during all her life permitted her instinctively but irreproachably to avoid unpleasantnesses, and to find prudent paths in time. And so now, after the sudden death of Roly Polly, and the suicide of Jenka which followed the next day, she, with her unconsciously penetrating soul foreguessed that fate, which had been favoring her house of ill fame, sending her good fortunes, steering her clear of all underwater shoals, was now getting ready to turn its back upon her. And she was the first to retreat. They say, that not long before a fire in a house, or before the wreck of a ship, the wise, nervous rats in droves make their way into another place. And Anna Markovna was directed by the same rat-like, animal, prophetic intuition. And she was right, immediately right after the death of Jenka some fearful curse seemed to hang over the house, formerly Anna Markovna Shabes, but now Emma Edwardovna Titzner's, deaths. Misfortunes, scandals just simply descended upon it ceaselessly, becoming constantly more frequent, on the manner of bloody events in Shakespeare's tragedies. As, however, was the case at all the remaining houses of the Yamas as well. One of the first to die, a week after the liquidation of the business, was Anna Markovna herself. However, this frequently happens with people put out of their accustomed rut of thirty years, so die war heroes, who have gone into retirement, people of insuperable health and iron will. So quickly go off the stage ex stockbrokers, who have happily gone into retirement and rest, but have been deprived of the burning allurement of risk and hazard. So too, age rapidly, droop, and grow decrepit, the great artists who leave the stage. Her death was the death of the just. While at a game of cards she felt herself unwell. Begged them to wait a while for her, saying that she would lie down for just a minute, lay down in the bedroom on a bed. Sighed deeply, and passed on into another world, with a calm face, with a peaceful, senile smile upon her lips. Isaiah Savage, her faithful comrade on the path of life, a trifle downtrodden, who had always played a secondary, a subordinate role, survived her only a month. Birdie was left sole heiress. She very successfully turned the cozy house into money, as well as the land somewheres at the edge of the town, married, as it had been presupposed, very happily. And up to this time is convinced that her father carried on a great commercial business in the export of wheat through Odessa and Navarasisk into Asia Minor. On the evening of the day when Jenny's corpse had been carried away to an anatomical theatre, at an hour when not even a chance guest appears on Yamskaya Street, all the girls, at the insistence of Emma Edwardovna, assembled in the drawing room. Not one of them dared murmur against the fact that on this distressing day, when they had not yet recovered from the impression of Jenka's horrible death, they would be compelled to dress up. As usual, in wildly festive finery, and to go into the brightly illuminated drawing room, in order to dance, sing, and to entice lecherous men with their denuded bodies. And at last into the drawing room walked Emma Edwardovna herself. She was more majestic than she had ever been, clad in a black silk gown, from which, just like battlements, her enormous breasts jutted out, upon which descended two fat chins, in black silk mittens. With an enormous gold chain wound thrice around her neck, and terminating in a ponderous medallion hanging upon the very abdomen. Ladies, she began impressively, I must. Stand up. She suddenly called out commandingly. When I speak, you must hear me out standing. They all exchanged glances with perplexity, such an order was a novelty in the establishment. However, the girls got up one after another, irresolutely, with eyes and mouths gaping. See Solen, you must from this day show me that respect which you are bound to show to your mistress, importantly and weightily began Emma Edwardovna. Beginning from today, the establishment in a legal manner has passed from our good and respected Anna Markovna to me, Emma Edwardovna Titzner. I hope that we will not quarrel, and that you will behave yourselves like sensible, obedient, and well-brought-up girls. I will be to you like in place of your own mother, but only remember, that I will not stand for laziness, or drunkenness, or notions of any sort, or any kind of disorder. The kind Madam Shabes, it must be said, held you in two loose reins. Oh oh, I will be far more strict. Discipline Uber Alice, before everything. It's a great pity, that the Russian people are lazy, 
dirty and stupid, and do not understand this rule, but don't you trouble yourself, I will teach you this for your own good. I say, for your own good, because my main thought is to kill the competition of Treple. I want that my client should be a man of substance, and not some charlatan and ragamuffin, some kind of student, now, or ham actor. I want that my lady should be the most beautiful, best brought up, the healthiest and gayest in the whole city. I won't spare any money in order to set up swell furnishings. And you will have rooms with silk furniture and with genuine, beautiful rugs. Your guests will no longer be demanding beer, but only genteel Bordeaux and Burgundy wines and champagne. Remember, that a rich, substantial, elderly man never likes your common, ordinary, coarse love. He requires cayenne pepper, he requires not a trade, but an art, and you will soon acquire this. At Treples they take three rubles for a visit and ten rubles for a night. I will establish it so, that you will receive five rubles for a visit and twenty-five for a night. They will present you with gold and diamonds. I will contrive it so, that you won't have to pass on into establishments of a lower sort, UND so wider, right down to the soldier's filthy den. No. Deposits will be put away and saved with me for each one of you every month. And will be put away in your name in a banker's office, where there will increase interest upon them, and interest upon interest. And then, if a girl feels herself tired, or wants to marry a respectable man, there will always be at her disposal not a large, but a sure capital. So is it done in the best establishments in Riga, and everywhere abroad. Let no one say about me, that Emma Edwardovna is a spider, a vixen, a cupping glass. But for disobedience, for laziness, for notions, for lovers on the side, I will punish cruelly and, like nasty weeds, will throw out, on the street or still worse. Now I have said all that I had to. Nina, come near me. And all the rest of you come up in turn. Ninka irresolutely walked right up to Emma Edwardovna, and even staggered back in amazement, Emma Edwardovna was extending her right hand to her, with the fingers lowered downward. And slowly nearing it to Ninka's lips. Kiss it, impressively and firmly pronounced Emma Edwardovna, narrowing her eyes and with head thrown back, in the magnificent pose of a princess ascending her throne. Ninka was so bewildered that her right arm gave a jerk in order to make the sign of the cross, but she corrected herself, loudly smacked the extended hand, and stepped aside. Following her Zoe, Henrietta, Vanda and others stepped up also. Tamara alone continued to stand near the wall with her back to the mirror. That mirror into which Jenka so loved to gaze, in gone by times, admiring herself as she walked back and forth through the drawing room. Emma Edwardovna let the imperious, obstinate gaze of a boa constrictor rest upon her, but the hypnosis did not work. Tamara bore this gaze without turning away, without flinching. But without any expression on her face. Then the new proprietress put down her hand, produced on her face something resembling a smile, and said hoarsely. And with you, Tamara, I must have a little talk separately, eye to eye. Let's go. I hear you, Emma Edwardovna, calmly answered Tamara. Emma Edwardovna came to the little bit of a cabinet, where formerly Anna Markovna loved to drink coffee with clotted cream. Sat down on the divan and pointed out a place opposite her to Tamara. For some time the women kept silent, searchingly, mistrustfully eyeing each other. You acted rightly, Tamara, said Emma Edwardovna finally. You did wisely in not stepping up, on the manner of those sheep, to kiss my hand. But just the same, I would not have let you come to that. I wanted right there, in the presence of all, when you walked up to me, to press your hand and to offer you the place of first housekeeper, you understand? My chief assistant, and on terms very advantageous to you. I thank you. No, wait a while, don't interrupt me. I will have my say to the end, and then you will express your pros and cons. But will you explain to me, please, when yesterday you were aiming at me out of a revolver, what did you want? Can it possibly be, to kill me? On the contrary, Emma Edwardovna, retorted Tamara respectfully, on the contrary, it seemed to me that you wanted to strike me. Pfui. 
What do you mean, Tamarachka? Have you paid no attention to the fact that during all the time of our acquaintance I never permitted myself, not only to hit you, but even to address you with a rude word? What do you mean, what do you mean? I don't confuse you with this poor Russian trash. Glory be to God, I am an experienced person and one who knows people well. I can very well see that you are a genuinely cultured young lady, far more educated, for example, than I myself. You are refined, elegant, smart. I am convinced of the fact that you even know music not at all badly. Finally, if I were to confess, I was a little, how shall I put it to you? I always was a little in love with you. And now you wanted to shoot me. Me, a person who could be a very good friend to you. Well, what will you say to that? Well, nothing at all, Emma Edwardovna, retorted Tamara in the meekest and most plausible tone. Everything was very simple. Even before that I found the revolver under Jenka's pillow and brought it, in order to give it over to you. I did not want to interfere, when you were reading the letter. But then you turned around to me, I stretched the revolver out to you and wanted to say, see, Emma Edwardovna, what I found, for, don't you see, it surprised me awfully how the late Jenny, having a revolver at her disposal, preferred such a horrible death as hanging. And that's all. The bushy, frightful eyebrows of Emma Edwardovna rose upward, the eyes widened joyously, and a real, uncounterfeited smile spread over her cheeks of a behemoth. She quickly extended both hands to Tamara. And is this all? Oh, main kind. And I thought. God knows what I imagined. Give me your hands, Tamara, your little charming white hands, and allow me to press the mouth main hers, upon my heart, and to kiss you. The kiss was so long, that Tamara with great difficulty and with aversion barely freed herself from the embraces of Emma Edwardovna. Well, and now to business. And so, here are my terms, you will be housekeeper, I give you fifteen percent, out of the clear gain. Mind you, Tamara, fifteen percent. And, besides that, a small salary, thirty, forty, well, if you like, fifty rubles a month. Splendid terms, isn't that the truth? I am deeply convinced, that none other than just you will help me to raise the house to a real height, and make it the swellest not only in our city, but in all the south of Russia as well. You have taste, and an understanding of things. Besides that, you will always be able to entertain, and to stir up the most exacting, the most unyielding guests. In rare instances, when a very rich and distinguished gentleman, in Russian they call it one, sunfish, while with us, E.I.N. Friar 33, when he becomes infatuated with you, for you are so handsome. Tamarachka, the proprietress looked at her with misty, humid eyes, then I do not at all forbid you to pass the time with him gaily. Only to bear down always upon the fact that you have no right, owing to your duty, your position, und so wider, und so wider. Aber Sagan see bit. Do you easily make yourself understood in German? Die Deutsche Sprache beherrschich in Gerendrum Grade ALS die Franzosisch, in Skenich Stets in Einer Salon Plotterei Mitmachen, 34. Oh, wunderbar. SIE haben ein entsuckend Rigor Ausbreak, die best alter Dutchen Ausbrachen. UND also, Fahren were in Unserer Sprache fort. See Klink veel Susser main amor, die Muttersprache. Sean. 35. Sean, 36. Zuletzt wurden sie Nachtjeben, dem Anschein nach Unjern, Unwilkerlich, von der Laune de Augenblicks Hindrissen, und, was die Hauptsache ist, Lotlos, Heimlich vor mir. See Verstehen. De Fürselen Neren ein Schwer's Geld. Ubrigens brosch ich sie wohl nicht zu Laren, 37. Ja, Nadig Frau. See Sprechen gar Kluge Dinge. Doc das ist schon kein Plotterei mehr, sundern ein Ernst Unterhaltung.38 and for that reason it is more convenient for me, if you will revert to the Russian language. I am ready to obey you. Furthermore. I was just now talking about a lover. I dare not forbid you this pleasure, but let us be prudent, let him not appear here, or appear as rarely as possible. 
I will give you days for going out, when you will be perfectly free. But it's best if you would get along without him entirely. It will serve your benefit too. This is only a drag and a yoke. I am telling you this from my own personal experience. Wait a while. After three or four years we will expand this business so, that you will have substantial money already, and then I will take you into the business as a partner with full rights. After ten years you will still be young and handsome, and then take and buy men as much as you want to. By that time romantic follies will go out of your head entirely, and it will not be you who will be chosen already, but you who will be choosing with sense and with feeling. As a connoisseur picks out precious stones. Do you agree with me? Tamara cast down her eyes, and smiled just the least trifle. You speak golden truths, Emma Edwardovna. I will drop mine, but not at once. For that I will need some two weeks. I will try not to have him appear here. I accept your proposition. And that's splendid, said Emma Edwardovna, getting up. Now let us conclude our agreement with one good, sweet kiss. And she again embraced and took to kissing Tamara hard, who, with her downcast eyes and naive, tender face, seemed now altogether a little girl. But, having freed herself, finally, from the proprietress, she asked in Russian. You see, Emma Edwardovna, that I agree in everything with you. But for that I beg you to fulfill one request of mine. It will not cost you anything. Namely, I hope that you will allow me and the other girls to escort the late Jenny to the cemetery. Emma Edwardovna made a wry face. Oh, if you want to, my darling Tamara, I have nothing against your whim. Only what for? This will not help the dead person and will not make her alive. Only sentimentalism alone will come out of it. But very well. Only, however, you know yourself that in accordance with your law suicides are not buried, or, I don't know with certainty, it seems they throw them into some dirty hole beyond the cemetery. No, do allow me to do as I want to myself. Let it be my whim, but concede it to me, my darling, dear, bewitching Emma Edwardovna. But then, I promise you that this will be my last whim. After this I will be like a wise and obedient soldier at the disposal of a talented general. Is gut. Emma Edwardovna gave in with a sigh. I cannot deny you in anything, my child. Let me press your hand. Let us toil and labor together for the common good. And, having opened the door, she called out across the drawing room into the entrance hall, Simeon. And when Simeon appeared in the room, she ordered him weightily and triumphantly. Bring us a bottle of champagne here, but the real thing, redder demi sec, and as cool as possible. Step on it. She ordered the porter, who was gaping at her with popping eyes. We will drink with you, Tamara, to the new business, to our brilliant and beautiful future. Willingly, my dear instructress, answered Tamara. You, like a genius, have cast light on my path. Why, really, none of us knew how kind and penetrating you are. It is only now that I have at last surmised that, before anything else, you demanded from us only order, only an irreproachable carrying out of our duty. Isn't that so? Oh, Ja! Answered the flattered Emma Edwardovna. Oh, Ja! And when the champagne had been drunk, Tamara said, And now, my dear mistress and preceptress, I would request something from you. By all means. I am very glad to have you do so. I feel that you will no more ask for any sentimental foolishness. I agree beforehand. Juicy, Tamara continued, I understand very well that my position will be partly that of a servant. The position of my assistant, Emma kindly corrected her. Merci, Tamara inclined her head. But you yourself have said that in rare, especially interesting cases I must be the most tantalizing and expensive lure? Absolutely so. That is precisely why I'm going to ask you for a small advance. You must agree that I am supposed to dress as a maid in a rich house, but with a special, provoking, tempting chic. Lace, perfumes. Emma fell into raptures. Oh, my dear Tamara. 
you catch my thoughts in their flight. I am happy. But still, it will be necessary for me to busy myself with my wardrobe, and that as soon as possible, but, to my regret. Ach, my dear, I shan't be niggardly for such things, how much do you need? I think, some two hundred rubles, said Tamara hesitatingly. Take three hundred. Tamara hypocritically kissed Emma. As she was going away from Emma, she reflected, with a malevolent smile. And so will bury like a human being a woman dear to us. They say that dead people bring luck. If there is any foundation at all in this superstition, then on this Saturday it could not have told plainer, the influx of visitors was out of the ordinary, even for a Saturday night. True, the girls, passing through the corridor or past the room that had been Jenka's increased their steps, timorously glanced at it sidelong, out of the corner of the eye. While others even crossed themselves. But late in the night the fear of death somehow subsided, grew bearable. All the rooms were occupied, while in the drawing room a new violinist was trilling without cease, a free and easy, clean-shaven young man. Whom the pianist with the cataract had searched out somewhere and brought with him. The appointment of Tamara as housekeeper was received with cold perplexity, with taciturn dryness. But, having bided her time, Tamara managed to whisper to little white Manka. Listen, Munya. You tell them all that they shouldn't pay any attention to the fact that I've been chosen housekeeper. It's got to be so. But let them do as they wish, only don't let them trip me up. I am as before, their friend and intercessor. And further on we'll see. Chapter 7 On the next day, on Sunday, Tamara had a multitude of cares. She had become possessed by a firm and undeviating thought of burying her friend despite all circumstances, in the way that one's nearest and dearest are buried, in a Christian manner. With all the sad solemnity of the burial of secular persons. She belonged to the number of those strange persons who underneath an external indolent calmness, careless taciturnity, egotistical withdrawal into one's self, conceal within them unusual energy. Always as though slumbering with half an eye, guarding itself from unnecessary expenditure, but ready in one moment to become animated and to rush forward without reckoning the obstacles. At twelve o'clock she descended in a cab into the old town, rode through it into a little narrow street giving out upon a square where fairs were held, and stopped near a rather dirty tea-room, having ordered the cabby to wait. In the room she made inquiries of a boy, red-haired, with a badger haircut and the parting slicked down with butter, if Senka the depot had not come here. The serving lad, who, judging by his refined and gallant readiness, had already known Tamara for a long time, answered that, no how, ma'am. They, seaman ignatic, had not been in yet, and probably would not be here soon seein, as how yesterday they had the pleasure of going on a spree at the Transvaal. And had played at billiards until six in the morning. And that now they, in all probabilities, are at home, in the halfway house rooms, and if the young lady will give the word, then it's possible to hop over to them this here minute. Tamara asked for paper and pencil, and wrote a few words right on the spot. Then she gave the note to the waiter, together with a half-ruble piece for a tip, and rode away. The following visit was to the artiste Rovinskia, living, as Tamara had known even before, in the city's most aristocratic hotel, Europe, where she occupied several rooms in a consecutive suite. To obtain an interview with the singer was not very easy, the doorman below said that it looked as if Elena Viktorovna was not at home. While her own personal maid, who came out in answer to Tamara's knocking, declared that Madame had a headache, and that she was not receiving anyone. Again Tamara was compelled to write on a piece of paper. I come to you from her who once, in a house which is not spoken of loudly, cried, standing before you on her knees. After you had sung the ballad of Dargamiski. Your kind treatment of her was so splendid. Do you remember? Do not fear, she has no need of anyone's help now, yesterday she died. But you can do one very important deed in her memory, which will be almost no trouble to you at all. While I, am that very person who permitted herself to say a few bitter truths to the Baroness T, who was then with you, for which truths I am remorseful and apologize even now. Hand this over, 
she ordered the chambermaid. She returned after two minutes. The madam requests you. They apologize very much that they will receive you not fully dressed. She escorted Tamara, opened a door before her, and quietly shut it after she had gone in. The great artiste was lying upon an enormous ottoman, covered with a beautiful Tekken rug and a multitude of little silk pillows, and soft cylindrical bolsters of tapestry. Her feet were wrapped up in silvery, soft fur. Her fingers, as usual, were adorned by a multiplicity of rings with emeralds, attracting the eyes by their deep and tender green. The artiste was having one of her evil, black days today. Yesterday morning some misunderstandings with the management had arisen. While in the evening the public had received her not as triumphantly as she would have desired, or, perhaps, this had simply appeared so to her. While today in a newspaper a fool of a reviewer, who understood just as much of art as a cow does of astronomy, had praised up her rival, Titanova, in a big article. And so Elena Viktorovna had persuaded herself that her head was aching, that there was a nervous tick in her temples, and that her heart, time and again, seemed suddenly to fall through somewheres. How do you do, my dear, she said, a trifle nasally, in a weak, wan voice, with pauses, as heroines on the stage speak when dying from love and from consumption. Sit down here. I am glad to see you. Only don't be angry, I am almost dying from migraine, and from my miserable heart. Pardon my speaking with difficulty. I think I sang too much and tired my voice. Rovinskia, of course, had recalled both the mad escapade of that evening, and the striking, unforgettable face of Tamara. But now, in a bad mood, in the wearisome, prosaic light of an autumn day, this adventure appeared to her as unnecessary bravado, something artificial, imagined, and pointedly shameful. But she was equally sincere on that strange, nightmarish evening when she, through the might of talent, had prostrated the proud Jenka at her feet, as well as now, when she recalled it with fatigue. Indolence, and artistic disdain. She, as well as many distinguished artists, was always playing a role. Was always not her own self, and always regarded her words, movements, actions, as though looking at herself from a distance with the eyes and feelings of the spectators. She languidly raised from the pillow her narrow, slender, beautiful hand, and applied it to her forehead. And the mysterious, deep emeralds stirred as though alive and began to flash with a warm, deep sparkle. I just read in your note that this poor, pardon me, her name has vanished out of my head. Jenny. Yes, yes, thank you. I recall it now. She died. But from what? She hanged herself, yesterday morning, during the doctor's inspection. The eyes of the artiste, so listless, seemingly faded, suddenly opened, and, as through a miracle, grew animated and became shining and green, just like her emeralds. And in them were reflected curiosity, fear and aversion. Oh, my God! Such a dear, so individualistically handsome, so fiery. Oh, the poor, poor soul. And the reason for this was? You know, the disease. She told you. Yes, yes. I remember, I remember. But to hang oneself. What horror. Why, I advised her to treat herself then. Medicine works miracles now. I myself know several people who absolutely, well, absolutely cured themselves. Everybody in society knows this and receives them. Ah, the poor little thing, the poor little thing. And so I've come to you, Elena Viktorovna. I wouldn't have dared to disturb you, but I seem to be in a forest, and have no one to turn to. You were so kind then, so touchingly attentive, so tender to us. I need only your advice and, perhaps, a little of your influence, your protection. Oh, please, my dear. All I can do, I will. Oh, my poor head. And then this horrible news. Tell me, in what way can I be of assistance to you? To confess, I don't know even myself yet, answered Tamara. You see, they carried her away to an anatomical theater. But until they had made the protocol. 
Until they made the journey, then the time for receiving had gone by also, in general I think that they have not had a chance to dissect her yet. I'd like, if it's only possible, that she should not be touched. Today is Sunday, perhaps they'll postpone it until tomorrow, and in the meanwhile something may be done for her. I can't tell you, dear. Wait. Haven't I some friend among the professors, in the medical world? I will look later in my memo books. Perhaps we will succeed in doing something. Besides that, continued Tamara, I want to bury her. At my expense. I was attached to her with all my heart during her life. I will help you with pleasure in this, materially. No, no. A thousand thanks. I'll do everything myself. I would not hesitate to have recourse to your kind heart, but this, you will understand me, this is something in the nature of a vow. That a person gives to oneself and to the memory of a friend. The main difficulty is in how we may manage to bury her with Christian rites. She was, it seems, an unbeliever, or believed altogether poorly. And it's only by chance that I, also, will cross my forehead. But I don't want them to bury her just like a dog, somewhere beyond the enclosure of the cemetery. In silence, without words, without singing. I don't know, will they permit burying her properly, with choristers, with priests? For that reason I'm asking you to assist me with your advice. Or, perhaps, you will direct me somewhere. Now the artiste had little by little become interested and was already beginning to forget about her fatigue, and migraine, and the consumptive heroine dying in the fourth act. She was already picturing the role of an intercessor, the beautiful figure of genius merciful to a fallen woman. This was original, extravagant, and at the same time so theatrically touching. Rovinskia, like many of her confreres, did not let one day pass by, and, if it were possible, she would not have let pass even one hour, without standing out from the crowd. Without compelling people to talk about her, today she would participate in a pseudo-patriotic manifestation, while tomorrow she would read from a platform. For the benefit of revolutionaries exiled to Siberia, inciting verses, full of fire and vengeance. She loved to sell flowers at carnivals, in riding academies, and to sell champagne at large balls. She would think up her little bon mots beforehand, which on the morrow would be caught up by the whole town. She desired that everywhere and always the crowd should look only at her, repeat her name, love her Egyptian, green eyes, her rapacious and sensuous mouth. Her emeralds on the slender and nervous hands. I can't grasp it all properly at once, said she after a silence. But if a person wants anything hard, he will attain it, and I want to fulfill your wish with all my soul. Stay, stay. I think a glorious thought is coming into my head. For then, on that evening, if I mistake not, there was with us. Beside the Baroness and me. I don't know them. One of them walked out of the cabinet later than all of you. He kissed Jenny's hand and said, that if she should ever need him, he was always at her service, and gave her his card, but asked her not to show it to any strangers. But later all this passed off somehow and was forgotten. In some way I never found the time to ask Jenny who this man was. While yesterday I searched for the card but couldn't find it. Allow me, allow me. I have recalled it, the artiste suddenly became animated. Aha! exclaimed she, rapidly getting off the ottoman. It was Ryazanov. Yes, yes, yes. The advocate Ernst Andreevich Ryazanov. We will arrange everything right away. That's a splendid thought. She turned to the little table upon which the telephone apparatus was standing, and rang. Central, 1835 please. Thank you. Hello. Ask Ernst Andreevich to the telephone. The artiste Rovinskia. Thank you. Hello. Is this you, Ernst Andreevich? Very well, very well, but now it isn't a matter of little hands. Are you free? Drop the nonsense. The matter is serious. Couldn't you come up to me for a quarter of an hour? No, no. Yes. 
only as a kind and a clever man. You slander yourself. Well, that's splendid, really. Well, I am not especially well-dressed, but I have a justification, a fearful headache. No, a lady, a girl. You will see for yourself, come as soon as possible. Thanks. Au revoir. He will come right away, said Rovinskia, hanging up the receiver. He is a charming and awfully clever man. Everything is possible to him, even the almost impossible to man. But in the meantime, pardon me, your name. Tamara was abashed, but then smiled at herself. Oh, it isn't worth your disturbing yourself, Elena Viktorovna. Mon nami de guerre is Tamara but just so, Anastasia Nikolaevna. It's all the same, call me even Tamara. I am more used to it. Tamara. That is so beautiful. So now, MLLE Tamara, perhaps you will not refuse to breakfast with me? Perhaps Ryazanov will also do so with us. I have no time, forgive me. That's a great pity. I hope, some other time. But, perhaps you smoke, and she moved toward her a gold case, adorned with an enormous letter E out of the same emerald she adored. Ryazanov came very soon. Tamara, who had not examined him properly on that evening, was struck by his appearance. Tall of stature, almost of an athletic build, with a broad brow, like Beethoven's, tangled with artistically negligent black, grizzled hair, with the large fleshy mouth of the passionate orator. With clear, expressive, clever, mocking eyes, he had such an appearance as catches one's eyes among thousands, the appearance of a vanquisher of souls and a conqueror of hearts. Deeply ambitious, not yet oversated with life. Still fiery in love and never retreating before a beautiful indiscretion. If fate had not broken me up so, reflected Tamara, watching his movements with enjoyment. Then here's a man to whom I'd throw my life. Jestingly, with delight, with a smile, as a plucked rose is thrown to the beloved. Ryazanov kissed Rovinsky's hand. Then with unconstrained simplicity exchanged greetings with Tamara and said. We are acquainted even from that mad evening, when you dumbfounded all of us with your knowledge of the French language. And when you spoke. That which you said was, between us, paradoxical, but then, how it was said. To this day I remember the tone of your voice, so warm, expressive. And so, Elena Viktorovna, he turned to Rovinskia again, sitting down on a small, low chair without a back. In what can I be of use to you? I am at your disposal. Rovinskia, with a languid air, again applied the tips of her fingers to her temples. Ah, really, I am so upset, my dear Ryazanov, said she, intentionally extinguishing the sparkle of her magnificent eyes, and then. My miserable head. May I trouble you to pass me the pyramidon from that table? Let me. Tamara tell you everything. I cannot, I am not able to. This is so horrible. Tamara briefly, lucidly, narrated to Ryazanov all the sad history of Jenka's death. Recalled also about the card left with Jenny, and also how the deceased had reverently preserved this card, and, in passing, about his promise to help in case of need. Of course, of course exclaimed Ryanzanov, when she had finished, and at once began pacing the room back and forth with big steps, ruffling and tossing back his picturesque hair through habit. You are performing a magnificent, sincere, comradely action. That is good. That is very good. I am yours. You say, a permit for the funeral. H.M. God grant me memory. He rubbed his forehead with his palm. H.M., H.M. If I'm not mistaken, Mono Canon, Rule 170, 170, 8. Pardon me, I think I remember it by heart. Pardon me. Yes, so. If a man slayeth himself, he shall not be chanted over, nor shall a mass be said for him, unless he were greatly astonished, that is, to wit, out of his mind. H.M. C.S.T. Timothy Alexandrin. And so, my dear miss, the first thing. You say, 
that she was taken down from the noose by your doctor, i.e., the official city doctor. His name? Klemenko. It seems I've met him somewheres. All right. Who is the district inspector in your precinct station? Burkish. Aha, I know. Such a strong, virile fellow with a red beard in a fan. Yes. Yes, that is he. I know him very well. There, now, is somebody that a sentence to hard labor is hankering after. Some ten times he fell into my hands, and always, the skunk, gave me the slip somehow. Slippery, just like an eel pout. We will have to slip him a little present. Well, now. And then the anatomical theater. When do you want to bury her? Really, I don't know. I would like to do it as soon as possible, if possible, today. H.M. Today. I don't vouch for it, we will hardly manage it. But here is my memorandum book. Well, take even this page, where are my friends under the letter T, just write the very same way, Tamara, and your address. In two hours I will give you an answer. Does that suit you? But I repeat again, that probably you will have to postpone the burial till tomorrow. Then, pardon my unceremoniousness, is money needed, perhaps? No, thank you, refuse tomorrow. I have money. Thanks for your interest. It's time for me to be going. I thank you with all my heart, Ellen Viktorovna. Then expected in two hours, repeated Ryazanov, escorting her to the door. Tamara did not at once ride away to the house. She turned into a little coffee house on Kafilikeskia Street on the way. There Senka the depot was waiting for her, a gay fellow with the appearance of a handsome saigon, not black, but blue-haired, black-eyed, with yellow whites, resolute and daring in his work. The pride of local thieves, a great celebrity in their world, the first leader of experience, and a constant, all-night gamester. He stretched out his hand to her, without getting up. But in the way in which he so carefully, with a certain force, seated her in her place could be seen a broad, good-natured endearment. How do you do, Tamarachka? Haven't seen you in a dog's age, I grew weary. Do you want coffee? No. Business first. Tomorrow we bury Jenka. She hanged herself. Yes, I read it in a newspaper, carelessly drawled out Senka through his teeth. What's the odds? Get fifty rubles for me at once. Tamarachka, my sweetheart, I haven't a kopeck. I'm telling you, get them, ordered Tamara, imperiously, but without getting angry. Oh, my lord. Yours, now, I didn't touch, like I promised, but then, it's Sunday. The savings banks are closed. Let them. Hawk the savings book. In general, it's up to you. Why do you need this, my dearie? Isn't it all the same to you, you fool? For the funeral. Oh. Well, all right then, sighed Senka. Then I'd best bring it to you myself in the evening. Right, Tamarachka? It's so very hard for me to stand it without you. Oh, my dearie, how I'd kiss and kiss you. I wouldn't let you close your eyes. Shan't I come? No, no. You do as I ask you, Sinechka. Give in to me. But you mustn't come, I'm housekeeper now. Well, what you know about that, drawled out the astonished Senka and even whistled. Yes. And don't you come to me in the meantime. But afterwards, afterwards, sweetheart, whatever you desire. There will be an end to everything soon. Oh, if you wouldn't make me suffer so. Wind things up as soon as you can. And I will wind him up. Wait one little week more, dearie. Did you get the powders? The powders are a trifle, discontentedly answered Senka. And it isn't powders at all, but pills. And you're sure when you say that they'll dissolve at once in water? Sure, I saw it myself. But he won't die. Listen, Senya, he won't die. Is that right? Nothing will happen to him. 
he'll only snooze for a while. Oh, Tamara, exclaimed he in a passionate whisper. And even suddenly stretched himself hard from an unbearable emotion, so that his joints cracked. Finish it, for God's sake, as soon as possible. Let's turn the trick in, bye bye. Wherever you want to go to, sweetheart. I am all at your will, if you want to, we start off for Odessa, if you want to, abroad. Finish it up as soon as possible. Soon, soon. You just wink at me, and I'm all ready, with powders, with instruments, with passports. And then, choo choo. The machine is off. Tamarachka. My angel. My precious, my sparkler. And he, always restrained, having forgotten that he could be seen by strangers, already wanted to embrace and hug Tamara to himself. Now, now. Rapidly and deftly, like a cat, Tamara jumped off the chair. Afterwards, afterwards, Sinechka, afterwards, little dearie. I'll be all yours, there won't be any denial, nor forbid dance. I'll myself make you weary of me. Goodbye, my little silly. And with a quick movement of her hand having rumpled up his black curls, she hastily went out of the coffee house. Chapter 8 On the next day, on Monday, toward ten o'clock in the morning, almost all the inmates of the house, formerly Madame Shabes. But now Emma Edwardovna Titzner's, rode off in cabs to the center of the city, to the anatomical theater, all, except the far-sighted, much-experienced Henrietta. The cowardly and insensible Ninka. And the feeble-minded Pashka, who for two days now had not gotten up from her bed, kept silent, and to questions directed at her answered by a beatific. Idiotical smile and with some sort of inarticulate animal lowing. If she were not given to eat, she would not even ask, but if food were brought, she would eat with greediness, right with her hands. She became so slovenly and forgetful, that it was necessary to remind her of certain necessary functions in order to avoid unpleasantness. Emma Edwardovna did not send out Pashka to her steady guests, who asked for Pashka every day. Even before, she had had such periods of a detriment of consciousness. However, they had not lasted long, and Emma Edwardovna in any case determined to tide it over, Pashka was a veritable treasure for the establishment, and its truly horrible victim. The anatomical theatre represented a long, one-storied, dark grey building, with white frames around the windows and doors. There was in its very exterior something low, pressed down, receding into the ground, almost weird. The girls one after the other stopped near the gates and timidly passed through the yard into the chapel. Nestled down at the other end of the yard, in a corner, painted over in the same dark grey colour, with white framework. The door was locked. It was necessary to go after the watchman. Tamara with difficulty sought out a bald, ancient old man, grown over as though with bog moss by entangled grey bristles. With little roomy eyes and an enormous, reddish, livid granulous nose, on the manner of a cookie. He unlocked the enormous hanging lock, pushed away the bolt and opened the rusty, singing door. The cold, damp air together with the mixed smell of the dampness of stones, frankincense, and dead flesh breathed upon the girls. They fell back, huddling closely into a timorous flock. Tamara alone went after the watchman without wavering. It was almost dark in the chapel. The autumn light penetrated scantily through the little, narrow prison-like window, barred with an iron grating. Two or three images without chasubles, dark and without visages, hung upon the walls. Several common board coffins were standing right on the floor, upon wooden carrying shafts. One in the middle was empty, and the taken-off lid was lying alongside. What sort is yours, now? Asked the watchman hoarsely, and took some snuff. Do you know her face or not? I know her. Well, then, look. I'll show them all to you. Maybe this one. And he took the lid off one of the coffins, not yet fastened down with nails. A wrinkled old woman, dressed any old way in her tatters, with a swollen blue face, was lying there. Her left eye was closed, while the right was staring and gazing immovably and frightfully, 
having already lost its sparkle and resembling mica that had lain for a long time. Not this one, you say. Well, look. Here's more for you, said the watchman. And one after the other, opening the lids, exhibited the decedents, all, probably, the poorest of the poor, picked up on the streets, intoxicated, crushed, maimed and mutilated. Beginning to decompose. Certain ones had already begun to show on their hands and faces bluish-green spots, resembling mold, signs of putrefaction. One man, without a nose, with an upper hair lip cloven in two, had worms, like little white dots, swarming upon his sore-eaten face. A woman who had died from hydropsy, reared like a whole mountain from her bored couch, bulging out the lid. All of them had been hastily sewn up after autopsy, repaired, and washed by the moss-covered watchman and his mates. What affair was it of theirs if, at times, the brain got into the stomach? While the skull was stuffed with the liver and rudely joined with the help of sticking plaster to the head? The watchmen had grown used to everything during their nightmarish, unlikely, drunken life. And, by the by, almost never did their voiceless clients prove to have either relatives or acquaintances. A heavy odor of carrion, thick, cloying. And so viscid that to Tamara it seemed as though it was covering all the living pores of her body just like glue, stood in the chapel. Listen, watchman, asked Tamara, what's this crackling under my feet all the time? Crackling? The watchman questioned her over again, and scratched himself, why, lice, it must be, he said indifferently. It's fierce how these beasties do multiply on the corpses. But who you looking for, man or woman? A woman, answered Tamara. And that means that all these ain't yours? No, they're all strangers. There, now. That means I have to go to the morgue. When did they bring her, now? On Saturday, Grandpa, and Tamara at this got out her purse. Saturday, in the daytime. There's something for tobacco for you, my dear sir. That's the way. Saturday, you say in the daytime? And what did she have on? Well, almost nothing. A little night blouse, an underskirt, both the one and the other white. So oh. That must be number 217. How is she called, now? Susanna Ratsina. I'll go and see, maybe she's there. Well, now, mamsells, he turned to the young ladies, who were dully huddling in the doorway, obstructing the light. Which of you are the braver? If your friend came the day before yesterday, then that means that she's now lying in the manner that the Lord God has created all mankind, that is, without anything. Well. Who of you will be the bolder? Which two of you will come? She's got to be dressed. Well, now, you go, Manka, Tamara ordered her mate, who, grown chill and pale from horror and aversion, was staring at the dead with widely open, limpid eyes. Don't be afraid, you fool, I'll go with you. Who's to go, if not you? Well, am I, well, am I, babbled little white Manka with barely moving lips. Let's go. It's all the same to me. The morgue was right here, behind the chapel, a low, already entirely dark basement, into which one had to descend by six steps. The watchman ran off somewhere, and returned with a candle end and a tattered book. When he had lit the candle, the girls saw a score of corpses that were lying directly on the stone floor in regular rows, extended, yellow, with faces distorted by premortal convulsions. With skulls split open, with clots of blood on their faces, with grinning teeth. Right away, right away, the watchman was saying, guiding his finger over the headings. The day before yesterday, that means, on Saturday, on Saturday. What did you say her name was, now? Raitsina, Susanna, answered Tamara. Raitsina Susanna, said the watchman, just as though he were singing, Raitsina, Susanna. Just as I said. 217. Bending over the dead and illuminating them with the guttered and dripping candle end, he passed from one to another. Finally he stopped before a corpse, upon whose foot was dabbed in ink, in large black figures, 217. 
here's the very same one. Let me, I'll carry her out into the little corridor and run after her stuff. Wait a while. Grunting, but still with an ease amazing in one of his age, he lifted up the corpse of Jenka by the feet, and threw it upon his back with the head down, as though it were a carcass of meat. Or a bag of potatoes. It was a trifle lighter in the corridor. And, when the watchman had lowered his horrible burden to the floor, Tamara for a moment covered her face with her hands, while Manka turned away and began to cry. If you need anything, say so, the watchman was instructing them. If you want to dress the deceased as is fitting, then we can get everything that's required, cloth of gold, a little wreath, a little image, a shroud. Gauze, we keep everything. You can buy a thing or two in, clothing. Slippers, too, now. Tamara gave him money and went out into the air, letting Menka go in front of her. After some time two wreaths were brought, one from Tamara, of Astor's and Georgina's with an inscription in black letters upon a white ribbon, to Jenny from a friend. The other was from Ryazanov, all of red flowers, upon its red ribbon stood in gold characters, through suffering shall we be purified. He also sent a short little note, expressing commiseration and apologizing for not being able to come, as he was occupied with an undeferrable business meeting. Then came the singers who had been invited by Tamara, fifteen men from the very best choir in the city. The presenter, in a grey overcoat and a grey hat, all grey, somehow, as though covered with dust, but with long, straight moustaches, like a military person's, recognized Verka opened his eyes wide in astonishment, smiled slightly and winked at her. Two or three times a month, and sometimes even oftener, he visited Yamskaya Street with ecclesiastical academicians of his acquaintance, just the same presenters as he, and some psalmists. And having usually made a full review of all the establishments, always wound up with the house of Anna Markovna, where he invariably chose Verka. He was a merry and sprightly man danced in a lively manner, in a frenzy, and executed such figures during the dances that all those present just melted from laughter. Following the singers came the two-horsed catafalque, that Tamara had hired, black, with white plumes, and seven torchbearers along with it. They also brought a white, glazed brocade coffin. And a pedestal for it, stretched over with black calico. Without hurrying, with habitually deft movements, they put away the deceased into the coffin, covered her face with gauze, curtained off the corpse with cloth of gold, and lit the candles, one at the head and two at the feet. Now, in the yellow, trembling light of the candles, the face of Jenka became more clearly visible. The lividness had almost gone off it, remaining only here and there on the temples, on the nose, and between the eyes, in party-colored, uneven, serpentine spots. Between the parted dark lips slightly glimmered the whiteness of the teeth, and the tip of the bitten tongue was still visible. Out of the open collar of the neck, which had taken on the color of old parchment, showed two stripes, one dark, the mark of the rope. Another red, the sign of the scratch, inflicted by Simeon during the encounter, just like two fearful necklaces. Tamara approached and with a safety pin pinned together the lace on the collar, at the very chin. The clergy came, a little grey priest in gold spectacles, in a skullcap. A lanky, tall, thin-haired deacon with a sickly, strangely dark and yellow face, as though of terracotta. And a sprightly, long-skirted psalmist, animatedly exchanging on his way some gay, mysterious signs with his friends among the singers. Tamara walked up to the priest. Father, she asked, how will you perform the funeral service, all together or each one separate? We perform the funeral service for all of them conjointly, answered the priest, kissing the stole, and extricating his beard and hair out of its slits. Usually, that is. But by special request, and by special agreement, it's also possible to do it separately. What death did the deceased undergo? She's a suicide, father. H.M., a suicide? But do you know, young person, that by the canons of the church there isn't supposed to be any funeral service, there ought not to be any? Of course, there are exceptions, by special intercession. Right here, Father. 
I have certificates from the police and from the doctor. She wasn't in her right mind, in a fit of insanity. Tamara extended to the priest two papers. Sent her the evening before by Ryazanov, and on top of them three banknotes of ten rubles each. I would beg of you, father, to do everything fitting, Christian-like. She was a splendid being, and suffered a very great deal. And won't you be so kind, go along with her to the cemetery, and there hold one more little mass. It's all right for me to go along with her to the cemetery. But in the cemetery itself I have no right to hold service, there is a clergy of their own. And also here's how, young person. In view of the fact that I'll have to return once more after the rest, won't you, now, add another little ten spot. For the cab. And having taken the money from Tamara's hand, the priest blessed the thurible, which had been brought up by the psalmist, and began to walk around the body of the deceased with purification. Then, having stopped at her head, he in a meek, wantedly sad voice, uttered. Blessed is our God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. The psalmist began pattering, Holy God, Most Holy Trinity, and Our Father, poured out like peas. Quietly, as though confiding some deep, sad, occult mystery, the singers began in a rapid, sweet recitative, With thy blessed saints in glory everlasting, the soul of this thy servant save. Set at rest. Preserving her in the blessed life, as thou hast loving kindness for man. The psalmist distributed the candles. And they with warm, soft, living little flames, one after the other, were lit in the heavy, murky air, tenderly and transparently illuminating the faces of the women. Harmoniously the mournful melody flowed forth, and like the sighs of aggrieved angels sounded the great words. Rest, O God, this thy servant and establish her in heaven. Wherein the faces of the just and the saints of the Lord shine like unto lights. Set at rest this thy servant who hath fallen asleep, contemning all her trespasses. Tamara was listening intently to the long familiar, but now long unheard words, and was smiling bitterly. The passionate, mad words of Jenka came back to her, full of such inescapable despair and unbelief. Would the all-merciful, all-gracious Lord forgive or would he not forgive her foul, fumy, embittered, unclean life? All-knowing, can it be that thou wouldst repulse her, the pitiful rebel, the involuntary libertine? a child that had uttered blasphemies against thy radiant, holy name? Thou, benevolence, thou, our consolation! A dull, restrained wailing, suddenly passing into a scream, resounded in the chapel. Oh, Janechka! This was little white Manka, standing on her knees and stuffing her mouth with her handkerchief, beating about in tears. And the remaining mates, following her, also got down upon their knees. And the chapel was filled with sighs, stifled lamentations and sobbings. Thou alone art deathless, who hast created and made man. Out of the dust of the earth were we made, and unto the same dust shall we return, as thou hast ordained me, creating me, and saying unto me, Dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Tamara was standing motionless and with an austere face that seemed turned to stone. The light of the candle in thin gold spirals shone in her bronze chestnut hair. While she could not tear her eyes away from the lines of Jenka's moist, yellow forehead and the tip of her nose, which were visible to Tamara from her place. Dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return, she was mentally repeating the words of the canticles. Could it be that that would be all, only earth alone and nothing more? And which is better, nothing, or even anything at all, even the most execrable? but merely to be existing. And the choir, as though affirming her thoughts, as though taking away from her the last consolation, was uttering forlornly. And all mankind may go. They sang, eternal memory, through, blew out the candles, and the little blue stream spread in the air, blue from frankincense. The priest read through the farewell prayer. And afterwards, in the general silence, scooped up some sand with the little shovel handed to him by the psalmist, and cast it crosswise upon the corpse, on top of the gauze. And at this he was uttering great words, filled with the austere, sad inevitability of a mysterious universal law, 
the world is the Lord's, and its fulfillment the universe. And all that dwelleth therein. The girls escorted their dead mate to the very cemetery. The road thither intersected the very entrance to Yamskaya Street. It would have been possible to turn to the left through it, and that would have been almost half as short, but dead people were not usually carried through Yamskaya. Nevertheless, out of almost all the doors their inmates poured out towards the crossroads, in whatever they had on, in slippers upon bare feet, in nightgowns, with kerchiefs upon their heads. They crossed themselves, sighed, wiped their eyes with their handkerchiefs and the edges of their jackets. The weather cleared up. The cold sun shone brightly from a cold sky of radiant blue enamel. The last grass showed its green, the withered leaves on the trees glowed, showing their pink and gold. And in the crystal clear, cold air solemnly. And mournfully reverberated the sonorous sounds, Holy God, Holy Almighty, Holy Ever-Living, have mercy upon us. And with what flaming thirst for life, not to be satiated by aught, with what longing for the momentary joy and beauty of being, transient like unto a dream. With what horror before the eternal silence of death, did the ancient refrain of John Damascene sound. Then a brief requiem at the grave, the dull thud of the earth against the lid of the coffin, a small fresh hillock. And here's the end said Tamara to her comrades, when they were left alone. Oh, well, girls, an hour earlier, an hour later. I'm sorry for Jenka. Horribly sorry. We won't ever find such another. And yet, my children, it's far better for her in her pit than for us in ours. Well, let's cross ourselves for the last time, and home. And when they all made the sign of the cross, Tamara suddenly uttered pensively the strange, ominous words. And we won't be long together without her, soon we will be scattered. By the wind far and wide. Life is good. Look, there's the sun, the blue sky. How pure the air is. Cobwebs are floating, it's Indian summer. How good it is in this world. Only we alone, we wenches, are wayside rubbish. And now let's go. The girls started off on their journey. But suddenly from somewhere on the side, from behind a monument, a tall sturdy student detached himself. He caught up with Lubka and softly touched her sleeve. She turned around and started upon seeing Solovev. Her face instantaneously turned pale, her eyes opened wide and her lips began to tremble. Go away, she said quietly, with infinite hatred. Lyoba. Lobachka, Solovev began to mumble. I searched, searched for you. I, honest to God. I'm not like that other, like Lycanin. I'm in earnest, even right now, even today. Go away. Still more quietly pronounced Lubka. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm not trifling, I mean marriage. Oh, you creature. Suddenly squealed out Lubka, and quickly, hard, peasant-like, hit Solovev on the cheek with her palm. Take that for all of us. Solovev stood a little while, slightly swaying. His eyes were like those of a martyr. The mouth half open, with mournful creases at the sides. Go away. Go away. I can't bear to look at all of you. Lubka was screaming with rage. Hangman, swine. Solovev unexpectedly covered his face with his palms and went back, without knowing his way, with uncertain steps, like one drunk. Chapter 9 And in reality, the words of Tamara proved to be prophetic, since the funeral of Jenny not more than two weeks had passed. But during this brief space of time so many events burst over the house of Emma Edwardovna as do not befall sometimes even in half a decade. On the very next day they had to send off to a charitable institution, into a lunatic asylum, the unfortunate Pashka, who had fallen completely into feeble-mindedness. The doctor said that there was no hope of her ever improving. And in reality, as they had placed her in the hospital on the floor, upon a straw mattress, so did she remain upon it without getting up from it to her very death. Submerging more and more into the black, bottomless abyss of quiet feeble-mindedness, 
but she died only half a year later, from bed sores and infection of the blood. The next turn was Tamara's. For about half a month she fulfilled the duties of a housekeeper, was all the time unusually active, energetic. And somehow unwantedly wound up with that inner something of her own, which was so strongly fomenting within her. On a certain evening she vanished, and did not return at all to the establishment. The matter of fact was. That in the city she had carried on a protracted romance with a certain notary, an elderly man, sufficiently rich, but exceedingly niggardly. Their acquaintance had been scraped up a year back, when they had been by chance travelling together on the same steamer to a suburban abbey, and had struck up a conversation. The clever, handsome Tamara, her enigmatic, depraved smile, her entertaining conversation, her modest manner of deporting herself, had captivated the notary. She had even then marked down for herself this elderly man with picturesque grey hair, with seignorial manners, an erstwhile jurisconsult and a man of good family. She did not tell him about her profession, it pleased her rather to mystify him. She only hazily, in a few words, hinted at the fact that she was a married lady of the middle class. That she was unfortunate in domestic life, since her husband was a gambler and a despot, and that even by fate she was denied such a consolation as children. At parting she refused to pass an evening with the notary, and did not want to meet him, but then she allowed him to write to her, general delivery, under a fictitious name. A correspondence commenced between them, in which the notary flaunted his style and the ardency of his feelings, worthy of the heroes of Paul Bourget. She maintained the same withdrawn, mysterious tone. Then, being touched by the entreaties of the notary for a meeting, she made an appointment in Prince Park, was charming, witty, and languishing. But refused to go with him anywhere. So she tortured her adorer and skillfully inflamed within him the last passion, which at times is stronger and more dangerous than first love. Finally, this summer, when the family of the notary had gone abroad, she decided to visit his rooms. And here for the first time gave herself up to him with tears, with twinges of her conscience, and at the same time with such ardor and tenderness. That the poor notary lost his head completely, was plunged entirely into that senile love, which no longer knows either reason or retrospect. Which compels a man to lose the last thing, the fear of appearing ridiculous. Tamara was very sparing of her meetings. This inflamed her impatient friend still more. She consented to receiving from him bouquets of flowers, a modest breakfast in a suburban restaurant. But indignantly refused all expensive presents, and bore herself so skillfully and subtly, that the notary never got up the courage to offer her money. When he once stammered out something about a separate apartment and other conveniences, she looked him in the eyes so intently, haughtily, and sternly, that he, like a boy, turned red in his picturesque grey hairs, and kissed her hands, babbling incoherent apologies. So did Tamara play with him, and feel the ground more and more under her. She already knew now on what days the notary kept in his fireproof iron safe especially large sums. However, she did not hurry, fearing to spoil the business through clumsiness or prematurity. And so right now this long-expected day arrived. A great contractor's fair had just ended, and all the notary's offices were transacting deals for enormous sums every day. Tamara knew that the notary usually carried off the money to the bank on Saturdays, in order to be perfectly free on Sunday. And for that reason on Friday the notary received the following letter, by messenger. My dear, my adored King Solomon. Thy Solomith, thy girl of the vineyard, greets thee with burning kisses. Dear, today is a holiday for me, and I am infinitely happy. Today I am free, as well as you. He has gone away to Hommel for twenty-four hours on business matters, and I want to pass all the evening and all the night in your place. Ah, my beloved! All my life I am ready to pass on my knees before thee. I do not want to go anywhere. The suburban roadhouses and cabarets have bored me long ago. I want you, only you, you, you alone. Await me, then, in the evening, my joy, about ten, eleven, o'clock. Prepare a great quantity of cold white wine, game, and sugared chestnuts. 
I am burning, I am dying from desire. It seems to me, I will tire you out. I cannot wait. My head is spinning around, my face burning, and my hands as cold as ice. I embrace you. Thy Valentina. That very same evening, about eleven o'clock, she artfully, through conversation, led the notary into showing her his fireproof cabinet, playing upon his odd, pecuniary vanity. The notary willingly opened his iron safe in her presence, and she without any difficulty read the secret letters on the dial. Rapidly gliding with her glance over the shelves and the movable boxes, Tamara turned away with a skillfully executed yawn and said. Fie, what a bore! And, having embraced the notary's neck, she whispered with her lips at his very ears, burning him with her hot breath. Lock up this nastiness, my treasure. Let's go. Let's go. And she was the first to go out into the dining room. Come here, now, Velodia, she cried out from there. Come quicker. I want wine and after that love, love, love without end. No. Drink it all, to the very bottom. Just as we will drain our love to the very bottom today. The notary clinked glasses with her and at one gulp drank off his glass. Then he drew in his lips and remarked. Strange. The wine seems to be sort of bitter today. Yes, agreed Tamara and looked attentively at her lover. This wine is always the least bit bitter. For such is the nature of Rhine wines. But today it's especially strong, said the notary. No, thanks, my dear, I don't want any more. After five minutes he fell asleep, sitting in his chair, his head thrown back against its back, and his lower jaw hanging down. Tamara waited for some time and started to awaken him. He was without motion. Then she took the lit candle, and, having placed it on the window sill giving out upon the street, went out into the entrance hall and began to listen, until she heard light steps on the stairs. Almost without a sound she opened the door and let in Senka, dressed like a real gentleman, with a brand new leather handbag in his hands. Ready? asked the thief in a whisper. He's sleeping, answered Tamara, just as quietly. Look, here's the key. They passed together into the study with the fireproof safe. Having looked over the lock with the aid of a flashlight, Senka swore in a low voice. The devil take him, the old animal. I just knew that it would be a lock with a combination. Here you've got to know the letters. It's got to be melted with electricity, and the devil knows how much time it'll take. It's not necessary, retorted Tamara hurriedly. I know the word. Pick it out, Zinaiti. Without the H. After ten minutes they descended the steps together. Went in purposely broken lines through several streets, hiring a cab to the depot only in the old city. And rode out of the city with irreproachable passports of citizens and landed proprietors, the Stavnitskys, man and wife. For a long time nothing was heard of them until, a year later, Senka was caught in Moscow in a large theft, and gave Tamara away during the interrogation. They were both tried and sentenced to imprisonment. Following Tamara came the turn of the naive, trusting, and amorous Verka. For a long time already she had been in love with a semi-military man, who called himself a civic clerk in the military department. His name was Delektorsky. In their relations Verka was the adoring party, while he, like an important idol, condescendingly received her worship and the proffered gifts. Even from the end of summer Verka noticed that her beloved was becoming more and more cold and negligent, and, talking with her, was dwelling in thought somewhere far, far away. She tortured herself, was jealous, questioned him, but always received in answer some indeterminate phrases, some ominous hints at a imminent misfortune. At a premature grave. In the beginning of September he finally confessed to her, that he had embezzled official money, big money, something around three thousand. And that after five days he would be checked up, and that he, Delektorsky, was threatened with disgrace, the court, and finally, hard labor. Here the civic clerk of the military department burst into sobs, clasping his head, and exclaimed, My poor mother! What will become of her? 
she will not be able to sustain this degradation. No. Death is a thousand times better than these hellish tortures of a being guilty of naught. Although he was expressing himself, as always, in the style of the dime novels, in which way he had mainly enticed the trusting Verka, still, the theatrical thought of suicide, once arisen. No longer forsook him. Somehow one day he was promenading for a long time with Verka in Prince. Already greatly devastated by autumn, this wonderful ancient park glistened and played with the magnificent tones of the foliage, blossoming out into colors, crimson, purple, lemon, orange and the deep cherry color of old, settled wine. And it seemed that the cold air was diffusing sweet odors, like precious wine. And yet, a fine impress, a tender aroma of death, was wafted from the bushes, from the grass, from the trees. Delektorsky waxed tender, gave his feelings a free rein, was moved over himself, and began to weep. Verka wept a bit with him, too. Today I will kill myself, said Delektorsky finally. All is over. My own, don't. My precious, don't. It's impossible, answered Delektorsky somberly. The cursed money. Which is dearer, honor or life? My dear. Don't speak, don't speak, Annetta. He, for some reason, preferred to the common name of Verka the aristocratic Annetta, thought up by himself. Don't speak. This is decided. Oh, if only I could help you, exclaimed Verka woefully. Why, I'd give my life away. Every drop of blood. What is life? Delektorsky shook his head with an actor's despondence. Farewell, Annetta. Farewell. The girl desperately began to shake her head. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Take me. I'll go with you too. Late in the evening Delektorsky took a room in an expensive hotel. He knew, that within a few hours, perhaps minutes, he and Verka would be corpses. And for that reason, although he had in his pocket only eleven kopecks, all in all, he gave orders sweepingly, like a habitual, downright prodigal. He ordered sturgeon stew, double snipes, and fruits, and, in addition to all this, coffee, liqueurs and two bottles of frosted champagne. And he was in reality convinced that he would shoot himself. But thought of it somehow affectedly, as though admiring, a trifle from the side, his tragic role, and enjoying beforehand the despair of his relatives and the amazement of his fellow clerks. While Verka, when she had suddenly said that she would commit suicide with her beloved, had been immediately strengthened in this thought. And there was nothing fearful to Verka in this impending death. Well, now, is it better to croak just so, under a fence? But here it's together with your dearie. At least a sweet death. And she frantically kissed her clerk, laughed, and with disheveled, curly hair, with sparkling eyes, was prettier than she had ever been. The final triumphal moment arrived at last. You and I have both enjoyed ourselves, Annetta. We have drained the cup to the bottom and now, to use an expression of Pushkin's, must shatter the goblet, said Delektorsky. You do not repent, oh, my dear. No, no. Are you ready? Yes, whispered she and smiled. Then turn away to the wall and shut your eyes. No, no, my dearest, I don't want it so. I don't want it. Come to me. There, so. Nearer, nearer. Give me your eyes, I will be gazing into them. Give me your lips, I will be kissing you, while you. I am not afraid. Be braver. Kiss me harder. He killed her, and when he looked upon the horrible deed of his hands, he then suddenly felt a loathsome, abominable, abject fear. The half-naked body of Verka was still quivering on the bed. The legs of Delektorsky gave in from horror. But the reason of a hypocrite, coward and blackguard kept vigil, he still had spirit sufficient to stretch away at his side the skin over his ribs, and to shoot through it. And, as he pulled the trigger, frantically crying out from pain, from fright, and from the thunder of the shot, the last convulsion was running through the body of Verka. While two weeks after the death of Verka, 
the naive, sportful, meek, brawling little white Menka perished as well. During one of the general, clamorous brawls, usual in the Yamkas, in an enormous affray, someone killed her, hitting her with a heavy empty bottle over the head. And the murderer remained undiscovered to the last. So rapidly did events take place in the Yamkas, in the house of Emma Edwardovna. And well nigh not a one of its inmates escaped a bloody, foul or disgraceful doom. The final, most grandiose, and at the same time most bloody calamity was the devastation committed on the Yamkas by soldiers. Two dragoons had been shortchanged in a ruble establishment, beaten up, and thrown out at night into the street. Torn to pieces, in blood, they returned to the barracks, where their comrades, having begun in the morning, were still finishing up their regimental holiday. And so, not half an hour passed, when a hundred soldiers burst into the Yamkas and began to wreck house after house. They were joined by an innumerable mob that gathered on the run, men of the Golden Squad, thirty-nine ragamuffins, tramps, crooks, souteneurs. The panes were broken in all the houses, and the grand pianos smashed to smithereens. The feather beds were ripped open and the down thrown out into the street. And yet for a long while after, for some two days, the countless bits of down flew and whirled over the Yamkas, like flakes of snow. The wenches, bareheaded, perfectly naked, were driven out into the street. Three porters were beaten to death. The rabble shattered, befouled, and rent into pieces all the silk and plush furniture of Treple. They also smashed up all the neighboring taverns and drink shops, while they were at it. The drunken, bloody, hideous slaughter continued for some three hours. Until the arrayed military authorities, together with the fire company, finally succeeded in repulsing and scattering the infuriated mob. Two half-ruble establishments were set on fire, but the fire was soon put out. However, on the next day the tumult again flared up, this time already over the whole city and its environs. Altogether unexpectedly it took on the character of a Jewish pogrom, which lasted for three days, with all its horrors and miseries. And a week after followed the order of the Governor-General about the immediate shutting down of houses of prostitution, on the Yamkas as well as other streets of the city. The proprietresses were given only a week's time for the settlement of matters in connection with their property. Annihilated, crushed, plundered. Having lost all the glamour of their former grandeur, ludicrous and pitiful, the aged, faded proprietresses and fat-faced, horse housekeepers were hastily packing up their things. And a month after only the name reminded one of Mary Yamskaya Street, of the riotous, scandalous, horrible Yamkas. However, even the name of the street was soon replaced by another, more respectable one, in order to efface even the memory of the former unpardonable times. And all these Henrietta's horses, fat kitties, Lelka's polecats and other women, always naive and foolish, often touching and amusing. In the majority of cases deceived and perverted children, spread through the big city, were dissolved within it. Out of them was born a new stratum of society, a stratum of the strolling, street prostitute solitaries. And about their life, just as pitiful and incongruous, but tinged by other interests and customs, the author of this novel, which he still dedicates to youths and mothers, will sometime tell. Author's Postscript This book has had a circulation, throughout the world, of more than two million copies, in Russian, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, Swedish, Finnish, Norwegian. Bohemian, Hungarian, English, 40 Polish, Lithuanian, and in other languages. 41. The real psychological success of this book cannot be attributed to an unwholesome curiosity on the part of its readers. I am deeply convinced of the fact that Yama has compelled many people to reflect, with sincere sympathy, about prostitution. But the author has always been, and up to this time remains, dissatisfied with the book. And truly, what a great number there exists of oppressive, insuperable, accursed problems, menacingly hanging over mankind, during the course of thousands of years, up to now. And at times bowing man down to the earth, bringing him down to the level of a low beast. War, prostitution, capital punishment, toil unendurable and poorly paid, the half-starved bondage of the greater majority in the service of the gluttonous minority. 
Of these evils I have always found the most evil to be the traffic in the body of woman, the traffic in the love of woman, this highest gift of God to mankind. But to me it seemed that mankind's ancient malady, prostitution, is the one most amenable to a speedy and successful cure. One has, thought I, but to say to man, you, now, have a revered, grey-haired grandmother, from whom you first heard the splendid folk songs. A grandmother who is the pride and the sovereign of the household. You have a mother, whose sweet breast you did on a time greedily and joyously suck, puckering up your blissful, sly little eyes. You have a wife, the mother of your babes, the maker of the family hearth. You have a sister, a playful, merry, marvelous girl, whose voice is song. Why, your eyes suffuse with blood, and your jaws quiver from wrath at the mere thought that someone has dared, in the presence of your dear little sister. To permit himself a phrase of double meaning, or a gesture too free. And, when it comes to your adored little daughter, I would not have the hardihood even to mention her. Yet you calmly go to professional women with your shillings, your dollars, your rubles, your francs, or your marks, for a surrogatum of love. For a convulsive imitation of passion, passion the sole end of which is the great mystery of the conception of new life. The end, and the justification. It is no justification at all for you that the woman has become stupid and has sunk low because of her, oh. Far from easy work. The gist of the matter is in this, that if her youth had been formed under conditions of kindness, care, and a minimum competence, she might be not only a happy mother, but a beloved sister. And a treasured daughter. Nor are you justified by the self-loving thought, my house is one thing. While the family of another is altogether a different thing, a family whose interests do not affect and do not engross me in the least, but, this is the reflection of a cannibal. For we do, after all, deem ourselves people of some little culture, and, just the least we bit Christians. And when, having satisfied your bestial lust, you are departing from the prostitute, barely concealing your squeamish revulsion, know and remember that you, at that moment, are many times lower and baser than the prostitute. Having taken advantage of the preposterousness of the contemporaneous order of life, you have robbed a blind beggar, you have slapped the face of a man with his hands bound. You have deceived a child. Yes. I, as best I knew and as best I could, wrote against prostitution, but I found no recipe against it. I know only that unfortunate women are driven into prostitution by, on the one side, poverty and poor schooling, on another, by temptations and promises. On the third, by ignorance of any trade, or inability to find any other work. But to write about all this, to shout, to preach, is it not in vain? It is frightful to contemplate how insignificant is the effect upon men and women of the most vivid, most frightful, most truthful word. Once, on a train going from Peterburg to the Crimea, some young engineers recognized me and requested permission to talk a little with me about prostitution. There, now, said they, you're exposing the sores of houses of ill fame, but what is your plan to avert that sexual hunger which, with such force, possesses maturing men? I answered as best I could. Coarse bed linen, a hard couch, a blanket neither thick nor overheating, a rigorously ventilated, cool bedchamber. A sleep sound, not too prolonged, and an early awakening, cold tubs or showers, food simple and unsophisticated with high seasonings, good literature, with manly, heroic works for choice. A very great deal of work, and play in the open air, coeducation of boys and girls. Finally, an early marriage, at twenty-five, say. For, after all, respectable girls do endure it until that age. The engineers retorted. We know all this. All these are palliatives. But they do not resolve the basic question, wherewith would you replace sexual satisfaction? Thereupon I lost my temper. I told them of the harsh answer the great Liev Tolstoy once made. On one occasion, at a large gathering of Russian, intelligence, nonsensical and very loquacious, Tolstoy was, in irritation. Criticizing the Russian governmental regime of his time. A certain young man put the question to him. Very well, Liev Nikolaevich. Let's say you're right, 
our regime is ailing, and fit for nothing. If you so desire, we shall destroy it. But what will you give us in place of it? Tolstoy answered cuttingly. Just imagine that you, God forbid, have contracted Louis. You come to me and ask me, what is this misfortune that has come upon me? And what am I to do now? I say, you are sick with such and such a disease. And here's what you are to do, go without delay to a doctor, and take the cure assiduously. But you suddenly retort to me, well, yes, I shall go to the doctor, and shall cure myself. But what will you give me in place of syphilis? I confess, it would be hard for me to answer you. Just so in my case. I, as much as I could, have truthfully pointed out the horrors of prostitution. But my work saw the light of day in a far from perfect state. A supersensitive, captious, hypocritical Russian censorship mutilated it until it was unrecognizable. A touchy public became frightened at it. Thousands of abusive, for the most part anonymous letters did I receive in Russia, and still receive them, now and then. I was accused of shaking the foundations of society, of corrupting youth, of pornography, etc. Many refused to understand my sincerely well-meant intentions. The first friendly, encouraging letters I received from elderly, brainy, worldly wise women, from honest youths who were horrified by their sexual longing, and even from young girls. I also treasure several letters from professional prostitutes, these latter epistles sin against grammar, but their contents are profound and touching. A strange thing, consolation, justification, and recognition I received in Paris, as an émigré. The Parisian press and the Parisian public responded very livelily to my sad novel when it came out in the French translation. The critics, with that finesse which is peculiar to French writers, pointed out the shortcomings, but their general opinion was unanimous, the work, despite certain coarse and bizarre features, was fully moral, and filled the reader's needs, inasmuch as it was permeated with a warm, human compassion. I breathed more freely. And now I rejoice very much that I am to succeed, at last, even though in another tongue, in restoring Yama as it was originally conceived. True, this is none too easy a matter. The deletions of censorship can be restored from memory. It is something else which presents difficulty. The novel was printed in Russia in a multitude of editions, but printed without plates, from previous editions, and for that reason there were set up in it a multiplicity of typographical errors. Which not only aroused vexation but at times distorted the text until it was perfectly incomprehensible. I have put all this in order, and am now tranquil. My work is in the hands of the very best American translator. And there is one more reason for me to rejoice over the fact that Yama is to appear in America. There, on a time, appeared Uncle Tom's cabin. Alexander Kuprin